live and direct. It's EMW TV with Winger Records uh, interviewing DJ Jaffa. Um, we're going live now. Um, Jem's having some technical issues. Hopefully he'll join soon and we might even get Hagee on as well. But, uh. Hold on a sec. Let me just close my window. Yeah, it sounds like it. Car just went past. So I was just like, oh. As you can see, this is live. So. Right. Oh, there we go. Sounds. So, let's go. So, DJ Jaffa, welcome to EMW TV and Winger Records. Thanks for joining us. Oh, what's happening, guys? Yeah, it's all good. Really excited about this. I'm a little bit nervous, if, you, if I don't mind saying that. Really. I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> ask the wrong questions or like miss out important things because there's so much to get through. But, uh, yeah, no, that's all good. Really grateful to have you on. Um, yeah, we were just saying actually before we started that like today especially people have been posting loads of uh, memories on this Cardiff Hip Hop Archive. It's been bringing up quite a few um, things and like I guess because of this interview you must have been thinking about um, a few memories as well. So I was just wondering yeah, yeah, yeah. if anything's on your mind currently, like, if, like you know, anything from your, your beginnings like i mean I, I know that you you said that you you started as a dancer like b-boy right is that is that correct yeah yeah, yeah. in like yeah about 82 i started it was basically when i was in school yeah and it was being um it was me and a friend of mine chrissy stevens um like i didn't really know him first of all and then he found out that I was into like breaking and stuff. And then he came over and he was like, oh, I'm going to break in as well. And then that was it. We sort of clicked up and started breaking. Um, I remember we, we had, uh, we had technical drawing together, but then it got to a point where we weren't taking, we weren't going to take the exam. So, uh, there, there was a, like a big space at the back of the classroom. So we said to the teacher, we said, Oh, can we, jump at the back and just practice breaking he was like what's breaking and then we showed him he was like yeah go on and as long as you don't uh, disturb the rest of class it's fine so we used to practice in technical drawing so and then like go on a school field practicing like cat pillars and <laughs> sort of That's sick. What age you then? yeah i was like i can't remember all the words i was like for about five, five, eight. what's that yeah. I don't know. I think that was just a technical fucking glitch. Yeah. Um, started breaking. Were you into hip hop music already, or was it the dancing that literally? It did? was the. Um, it was like the electro albums that came out on Street Sounds. So that was my sort of introduction to the music. Was um, just listening to them. Yes, yeah, what's happening, Jim? Yeah, we got Jim in the He's building. Joined us. Um, well, unmute yourself. Yeah, the Street Sounds albums were the we used to just like just take the album and then that was our put in a, like a beatbox and that was that was our introduction to hip-hop basically through that to electro so from the start of you breaking what's what's the gap between there and then you actually being like oh i'm in love with the music as well and i want to be active in it i want to dj um Probably more or less the start of it. Well, it probably around about 84, I started really getting into it properly and stuff. But, but, um, next I started to de in my youth club. Like, there's a bit of, like, I, I thought, like, before I was like, right, I DJ, started DJ in 85. I did 85 because I started scratching in 85. And I started like DJing in a youth club, but I had my text in 86. So it's 85, 86, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But getting in the music, I think was probably around about 84, 83, 84, when I started like really getting into it. Um, breaking started going out then as well. And I thought, you know, I, I love the music so much now, what am I going to do? And then I, I, at that time as well, I was hanging around in Bristol um, and there was a guy called uh, Dennis Murray, who was a, he was a B-boy. Um, 
he started DJing, had a sound system called Bush Ploy. Um, so I started watching him and he was like the first person I ever saw in front of me do, doubling up. He was, he was cutting up, um, what's it? My, uh, no, 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 headline news by Midnight Star, I think it is. And at the beginning of it, it sort of said, um, it went extra, extra, read all about it. And then he just goes in and he just did that back and forth. It was at uh, uh, St. Paul's Carnival. And he was DJing right. for, he was DJing for um, a sound system called Galaxy Affair at the time. He had his own sound system, Bush Club. He was DJing at that time for uh, Galaxy Affair. So I was just with him there. And that was the first time I ever saw him cutting up in front of me. Um, and at the same time as well, like, the Wild Bunch, who were now Massive Attack, they had uh, they had their sound system set up at the top of like there's this hill going all the way down to the front line in St Paul's, and they had their sound system right at the top, and that was the first time I saw um, I heard Eric B as president when they just come back from New York and it was on Zakia Records and they had like uh, a a disc of cardboards covering the the label so no one knew what it was mm. and that was the first time i heard that i was just blowing my mind and to this day that's my favorite record of all time yeah uh, i love it so um yep. go ahead hey what's happening jim that man sorry boys i fucking <clears throat> so uh, even though i've got like 20 million iPad chargers i couldn't find the single ones so i just had to like re-download zoom on my phone and then try and figure out my password and then all that shit and then get really angry at the computer and just it went through a little uh, stage but i'm here now how's it going jeff are you right i'm good man yeah Sad. yeah i just wanted to touch on sorry actually that you've already mentioned right because it's really important and it's something that's come up like generationally is like this youth club and a particular youth club it's grassroots right in Cardiff, is that the one that you're talking about, or is that no, no, it? no? Grassroots yeah. was the place we did our first like, um, like, I when I first started, oh, I did my first ever gig was outside um, this place called Rudy's Donut Store in Queen Street. Right. It's where you know where Sainsbury's is, right at the other end of Queen Street, not the Castle End, the other end. Yeah, on the corner. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. there used to be right on the corner. There used to be a donut store run by this guy called Rudy, this old Jamaican guy. Um, I knew his daughter from St. Melons and um, he said, yeah, you know, come down, set up. It was like a doorway by the side of the store. So he said, oh, come down, set up, play some music on a Saturday afternoon. So I was a bit like, oh, I don't know whether I should do it. Or, but I ended up getting pushed into it by my mates. So. And that was that was that was 1982. No, 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 no. This is this is uh, like 86 now. 86. Okay. Yeah, 86. Was it 86? 86 or 87, something like that. It's yeah. those three years. It's like 85, 86, 87 that are like starting DJing first gigs. Those three years are sort of the the start of it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I sat up there. Didn't know any MCs at the time, so I just took a microphone. I was like, oh, I wonder if any rappers are going to come and, you know, whatever. Didn't know anyone. It was like, you know, totally pre-internet. No one knew anything that was going on like that. Um, so I took a microphone, started playing tune, and then uh, this guy came over and started, grabbed the microphone and started rapping, and this, that was uh, my friend DK. And... Uh, he started rapping over, I said, put your feelers on by Schooly D. And I had two yeah. copies of it. So I was like backspinning two copies of this back and forth, just the beat. And he started rapping over that. And I was just like, oh, this is amazing. This is, this is real hip hop. Yeah, I'm just loving it. Um, and then after that, then, like through the day, I was playing music. Police came along. They were like, oh, you got to turn it off. Okay, turned it off. Wait till they go, turn it back on again. All that, see, that thing. Um, but after that, then we got the bug and it was like, right, it was like, there was me, um, my mate Akko, there was, uh, Leroy, this other guy, Leroy Bishop, who went into the name Finer, he was a graffiti artist. 
this uh, for the there's like few other people who they, we, we all wanted to do this jam. So this is where Grassroots comes into it. Right. Uh, Grassroots was the City of Saint Youth project. We all used to go there, um, you know, to, just hang out, use the rehearsal rooms or whatever. Um, it was like a cafe there and stuff, but. But we used to go there, and there was a guy that we worked there, Mark, and he he loved what we were doing. Like, cause we, like sometimes, like some of us would just plug a microphone into a speaker and pretend to, you know, round beatbox or whatever. So we took this to him, and said, "Look, we want to put a jam on like a Saturday afternoon," and they had a sound system in there. And he said, "Cool, you know, just come along. We'll set the sound system up. Just have like a pound at the door or something like that. Just put it towards the." Uh, this, uh, the youth project uh, and so we did that um leroy designed a flyer um i just put on there any you know because i didn't get dk's details of anything after i have to be rap he just sort of went so i just put i just put on there uh, on the flyer um any mt welcome so um set DK came down, um, Eric, who wants to be me, one and MC Eric, Technotronic, all that. He came down. Um, there's another guy, Bubba, Chaga, um, I think it was, it was, it was Ford, he was there. It, it was a hat, you know, a few of them, and they, they all sort of had a little go on, um, on the mic and stuff. Um, I was crapping myself. It was first time on stage in front of people. But yeah, it was uh, it was a weird time. Um, but we had oh, it's another guy, Tucker from Combran came down. MC Bass, I think he ran under the name of um, MC Bass. <laughs> and that was the first MC Bass. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you have you ever because I know you did like a lot of um, like rave stuff out, uh, after. No, but anyway. Um, yeah, he came down, he was spitting and stuff. Uh, we wanted to do more of them. We did, we did another one after, do you remember? I don't know if you, I'm sure my age now, but there used to be a program called Get Fresh on Saturday morning TV. It was Gaz Top and he had like, a, there's a puppet on there, some alien puppet thing or whatever on there. But the, anyway, it was like kids program on Saturday morning. Um, and they did one from the old ice rink in Cardiff. Cardiff oh, yeah. Devils. Okay. Yeah, you sit where, um, I think it's, what's that? There's a big shop there now or something like that. But um, they did it there, and it was on July the 4th. And they, because it was American Independence Day, they wanted to do something American. So what's more American than graffiti on trains? <laughs> well, they had these big boards put up and like an outline of subway trains on them. And they got the artists to go and do it. So there were some kids, there were some kids who went and done it, uh, did it. I didn't really know them, uh, but then it was like our crew. So it was like Akko and, and Leroy. Um, and then we took Dex down there, set up by the sides of the graffiti and it was DK and Eric came down and rapped, but because of licensing, I couldn't play any records. So I had a little 606, Roland 606 drum machine. So I plugged that into the mixer, just programmed some beats on it, played the beats and just scratched and they rapped. Yeah. Nice. After that, then um, we had a jamming grassroots. So we were telling everyone, oh, come grassroots, come grassroots after that. Um, so we left, went, sat up. And you're like, oh, no one's going to turn up, no one's going to turn up. Next thing you know, loads of people just turned up for the door. And it was it was packed. It was absolutely rammed in there. At, at this time, yeah. were you conscious that, like, other kids your age were also listening or, like, getting involved in hip-hop before you started do, making these actions, like, before you took those decks to the corner of Queen Street? Um, before you, like, were you aware that there was other, like, people in your area that would appear out of nowhere or was that a surprise for you when that happened like? it surprised me a bit because like i said this is pre-internet yeah. and the only time we sort of 
connected is it like if you go into town and happen to see someone and it was like it was a time where you'd look at someone's trainers and you knew they were in the hip-hop because they had like fat laces in them and stuff yeah um so that was the only connection we had so but it, it, it was it wasn't i suppose it was surprising the amount of people who were really getting into it but i knew all my sort of circle all my friends they were into it you know so yeah, yeah it was you weren't like a cast for being into that at that time. That was, it was the thing like. Yeah, because like there was, with the b-boying and stuff as well, it was crews all around. It was like Street Snakes, it was like Electro Force, it was DBS DMCs, it was my crew, which is the original name of Street Crew. <laughs> Terrible name, but never mind. Um, Street. <laughs> but, Street. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was terrible, but I, I don't know. Like, yeah, let's call ourselves Street Crew. They're like, nah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there was all, there was crews like with the breaking and stuff. So I knew it was that scene going on. And then there was like people getting into the music and stuff. That was, it was a bit more, a bit surprising because it was like the only records were like they had like a, a small sort of import section in HMV, small little import section in Spillers. So, you know, you wanted to get, decent records and I mean you had to go out of Cardiff go to like Bristol or London or something but yeah you know later on then it was like mail order it was like I just get stuff from spin off records and stuff wake up wake up in the morning there's a delivery for me and (laughs) wake my parents up so to touch on all of this is kind of uh kind of pre the jive thing is it pre the 90 uh the 89 release yeah 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 this is yeah like all of this is happening like 87 yeah because we went and then we moved, we moved no, to 88 so yeah yeah that's what i was gonna say so you moved you moved specifically to london for the jive thing was it yeah. or to, to look for a label happened. yeah what happened was we did a gig in the Ritzy nightclub, which was, the, I don't know what generation you'd know it as, but it, um, it went on, like Vision 2 Where the spoons now, bro? No, no, it was, um, <laughs> it, was uh, it went through, like from, like back in my parents' day, it was like top rank. Then it was like the Ritzy, um, then it went into like, I, later on it was like Vision 2K but it was in Queen Street it was a huge night, nightclub you'd go downstairs and it was, it was massive but we did a gig there they had like um, Funk and Soul Night on a Monday night and we got asked to do a PA so there was me Eric DK for the we went in there set at decks and I was just back spinning break beats and they were just rapping after that then Eric was the one he was like, oh yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something. And next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call off him. Um, I got a manager, I'm up in London, come up, come up. I was like, what are you on about? And his brother um, was a boxer and he had a manager who wanted to get into music, um, wanted to get music management, wanted to manage a band or group, whatever. So Eric basically convinced him to manage us. Um, so I had the phone call in the morning. By the afternoon, I was, I was on the train and going to London. Um, Sounds like a movie. Yeah, it was like, no, I'm going to London. Yeah, okay. I've seen that movie. <laughs> it's a good movie. It was the same with Bristol. It's like, Jaffa goes to London. I, I was, when I was going to Bristol, breaking and stuff, I was like still in school. I'd come home on a Friday, go to, go to Bristol, and then she wouldn't see me until like Sunday evening or Monday morning when I'm going back to school. And, stuff. and this was like no mobiles. If I didn't phone her, she didn't have a clue what I was, you know. Um, yeah. We were going like warehouse parties and all sorts of shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I went up to London, um, met the, ma- uh, the guy who wanted the managers, Alfred Giacuno. Um, and he basically got a studio time uh, we went into a studio, cut a demo, and only 
just by chance, the, the samples we use, we used like a reggae sample in the demo. And uh, Alfred took it, tried shopping it around, and he took it to Jive. And the a and at Jive was putting together this deaf reggae compilation. Mm. He had the, the reggae sort of influence on, on the demo. And he's like, yeah, I, I want to sign these guys, you know, put them on this compilation. So that's how we got in. Basically. But that was that a, a reggae compilation, or that was like a more digitally dance hall compilation? Was it? it was, was, no, it was. Um, was it, it was like, hip reggae it, compilation. Okay, so it was a, an amalgamation. That was their kind yeah, of yeah. vibe. Yeah, it was, I think like hip hop reggae was sort of getting a bit of a buzz at the time. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, what was it? Deaf, deaf reggae, wasn't it? Was that, yeah. It was. Um, it was like we were on there. There was We Pappers were on there because I mean We Pappers were, at the time were the only UK acts signed to Jive. Um, I may be wrong, but I think that they were just about the only one. And then there was uh, a few other acts they just signed for this compilation. It was like Family Quest they signed, who were like Family Quest who had been around for a while. They they won the um, Street Sounds comp, uh, Street Sounds competition to perform at um, Fresh 86. And they had like a single out and the single was uh, Sleepwalking, which was, you know, a really good, really good track. Um, oh, my daughter's with the moment. Libby! Hi. I'm in a meeting. Pardon? I'm in a meeting. You're in a meeting? Yeah. Sorry. Right, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, professional, bro, meeting. Me, <laughs> it sounds well, well professional, um, yeah. Yeah, would uh, I found that interesting, uh, with that the the, the mixtape thing, how that at the time, like, it, um, is it on your YouTube video? Maybe it was someone else's, but it's described as like ragamuffin UK hip hop. Oh, that was on that other one, yeah. It was, and yeah. I think at the time in that 80s, 90s period, do you know Silver Bullet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Silver Bullet used to live next door, literally like where I am now, next door to us. He's a good friend of my uncle's, and he lives just down the street That's now. Like, right. uh, yeah, he's moved to Wales. Yeah, he lives. He's like, he's been good mates with my uncle in the past, and it. So I'd put him in that same category, but it's that like ragamuffin, fast-paced style UK hip hop, which is not really a thing anymore. No. But at the time, that balance of reggae and dub culture and drum and bass. And ragga and hip hop, and it was like a genre, like a genre, isn't it? For a bit, like yeah, it's, it's like not a... really a thing now, but that's definitely something that, like ragga muffin, ragga UK, whatever. Yeah. Um, what was it? Da um, Ashley and Daddy Freddy were signed to like uh, Musical Life Records and stuff, and they did that whole sort of ragga muffin hip hop thing. Yeah. yeah they, I remember they when me and Eric. Um, we were in London and we had we recorded the tracks and stuff and we came down to back down to Cardiff and we did a gig um in Cooper's Field. And it was for it was for grassroots. Um and they, they booked Ashley and Daddy Freddy and, and um Einstein. And uh, I remember Eric battled them on stage because Did you say Asher D? Asher, yeah, but not the Ash D from uh, No Asher D. <laughs> actually, it was Ashley and Daddy Freddy with uh they were, they were assigned to Musical Life. Um, I think Daddy Freddy, he had the world record for the fastest rap or something like that. Yeah. But, um, but right. back then, it was like me and Eric were performing and then uh, something happened and Daddy Freddy went on stage and started having a go at Eric and then they battled or some, something weird happened like that. And I was, I was DJing, I was back spinning a beat and uh, it was a bit shitty, really, because like Eric, Eric was rapping, I was on beat, and then as soon as Daddy Freddy went on, I was on beat, and then I went, oh, off beat, sorry. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, it is what it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, and it was, yeah, what was I saying then? Yeah, the compilation then, um, yeah, that came out in like '89, so we recorded in '88. 89 the compilation came out um and in between then we were doing like uh demos at battery studios 
So we worked with um, Master Mix. We did a demo with uh, DJ Crypt. So we were meeting all these, like like Master Mix and that um, his crew. They were all like down with Blades and all that sort of crew. Like, and it it turned out one of them lived across the road from me when I lived in I lived in Lewisham. I didn't even know. Him, so, okay. but all of that crew, all of that, that crew lived in that area. Um, but we did, I think, about three or four demos. But then we just used to go to Battery Studios and just hang out as well. Like we became really good friends with We Papa, Bill Rappers. Um, we used to go to their flat and get drunk and shoot air pistols with targets and stuff. And stuff. I thought you were going to say shoot smack then. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, you really are wrong stage, I think. Went to her flat in Acton. No, it was Acton? No, Hammersmith. In Hammersmith. And we just got really drunk and she had an air pistol and she just put a target on the set and we were just like shooting this target, having a game so you can get the closest to the ball. Like, it's weird. I just want to take a second because um, a few things have been coming in. So I just want to say big up for all the questions. Um, we're doing a little retrospective, but I think we can also break out with some of the questions coming in occasionally. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm liking the backstories at the moment, though, so like, it's cool. But yeah, don't worry, your questions are listened to, and we'll answer, we'll try and get them all answered. Like um, again, it's EMW TV and Winger Records interviewing DJ Jaffa, and we're still in the '80s at the moment, are we? Yeah, yeah well, still in the got... '80s. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. welcome to the time travel machine. <laughs> I'm not sure um I'm not sure where where this ties in on a chronological order, but uh the Simpsons thing. <laughs> <laughs> when, did, when did that come from? Right, that's a long way in the future, but all right, George, well, should we leave it? Should we do it chronologically? Nah, go yeah. on, non linear man, it's all the way. Like just we'll go jump I'm about. Going a bit. To go into it? Yeah, go on. I miss up to you, man. Right. Um, I used to do I used to DJ for um, a group called Vibe Tribe um, it was put together by this producer called Greg Havers um, he's done like stuff with Man Street Preachers um, like Mel C or stuff, stuff like that but he back in the day he had he put together this group called Vibe Tribe and um, the DK was the rapper. There was a singer, I can't even remember her name, Mary something, but she ended up going solo and had like a top 10 hit or something. Um, I can't remember who else it was. Lennis Esprit was in it. Um, but anyway, it was like a sort of, that sort of like almost poppy funk, soul to soul -y type sounds you know what I mean with that, that type that same type of drum beat but he wanted a DJ as well so he got me um, we did some showcases we went to London and then they showcased for all these record labels blah 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 um, and then through that connection then when that all fizzled out and then he had the connection with me then so he uh, got a publishing deal James phoned this fell over <laughs> He had uh, got a publishing deal with EMI and in that publishing deal, they asked him to do a track for the Simpsons second album. Um, as you do. So yeah, as they do. Uh, so he got DK to write the rap and he wanted scratching in it. So he got me to go do the scratching on it. Um, he demoed it sent her away then nancy is it nancy cartwright does the voice of bart yeah yeah but yeah then she obviously recorded her rap and everything and then it came out years later yeah it was the second album the second album just sort of got shelved for a bit and then it got released years later but it was like i think there's a track by cnc music factory on there i think like prince wrote a track for it it's just, it's it's a mad it's a mad music credit to have in it because I know you've got like your music actual, credit. Yeah, I'm on the actual history. Wikipedia. Yeah, you're on the fucking Simpsons Wikipedia, like DJ Jaffa. Like. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a crazy. wicked fine, man. I don't care what you say. That's the biggest achievement. That was <laughs> the big, yeah. yeah. That's it. Thank you over. Yeah, it was. Um, 
it was strange. Uh, but when it came out as well, I did, cause I did, I just, I just did it, and then it was just that was it. I just forgot about it because it, it didn't come out straight away. And then Greg sort of messaged me. He was like, "Oh, it's out now." I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so went to HMV or whatever, seen the CD. Or, but yeah, that was a weird one. But that was years later. But um, this is fun. I got a yeah. guy here called uh, David DJ Moon Kajini. I think I've said it right. And he said, uh, loving the stories. I remember the first time I saw you was at some club in Murphy. Tickets sold by Spillers oh, at the time. DK, yeah, DK and 4D was there too. We all jumped on a bunch of coaches from Cardiff. You were one of the inspirations to get me into DJing and scratching along with yourself and Silver. Yes, I'm Silver Martin, yeah. Oh man, yeah, I remember Shabonies. That was mad. Was that where, what kind of time was that? It was. I can't even remember the year now. It was early nineties. Okay, so we're going back a little bit. <laughs> we're coming back. Uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't remember the exact year. Like it was. It was. Um, uh, it was put together by Ron. Ron Warner. Nice. Um, he put it together with um, my mate Scott, who's the work with Ron. Um, and they had a clothing company called Too, Too Much Safe Clothing or something. Um, and they, they basically wanted to put a jam together. So they booked out this club called Chabonnier's in Murphy, which was a converted church. And it was huge. Uh, so they booked me. There was DJ Dino. Um, then there was DK and Fordy who were rapping. And then they had like um, some like old dancers came up from Cardiff. It was like like um, Gary Greed and Julian Conton. And they were sort of like two of the best in Cardiff at the time. And they, they went on to be in a Technotronic video later on and stuff. But yeah, they, they went up and it, it was absolutely packed in there like hundreds and hundreds of people uh coaches went from cardiff all the way up there um the first one was absolutely amazing the second one it was really good but it didn't seem to be as full um but they had london posse on the second one is it yeah they booked london posse for the second one. Wow. So, what year was we say again what year was that again <laughs> i'm not <laughs> where some somewhere <laughs> in the nineties. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, just like, in the nineties. Somewhere. Probably be like screaming. It was nineteen. Or yeah, yeah, but, yeah. If you know, if you know the exact date, just write it in the comments to put us out of misery. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I am. Oh uh, yeah, Matt Herbert. Big up yourself. Uh, Seven hundred plus people in the first one. He said. So. Oh uh, yeah, shouts Junior this bro. Yeah. What's happening, Junior? Junior. Yeah. But, so, um, so, yeah, where uh, we. Sort of like a question on that. Um, Sorry, I just wonder, like, is that the biggest crowd you'd ever played to, or was that like, was there bigger crowds before that? Is that sort of like? Oh, at that at the time, I yeah, it's probably the biggest. Okay, so at that time, guys, I'll let you try and bring it back a little into the eighties again because we're yeah, well, we right, so. We were in the 80s, weren't we? Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> so, so you were in London, you were on Jive Records. Yeah. On London, on, in, yeah. So, yeah, we were hanging out. So we used to hang out at, um, like, Battery Studios a lot. Like, Eric became friendly with, I think it was Donna from She Rockers, and they used to hang out a lot, and we used to hang out with the Wee Pappers. And then we just used to go there, just chill in the rec room and stuff, and it was like, we, we were there the one time when... Um, hijack went there to get signed to jive and they turned them down which was probably one of the biggest mistakes they made but they, they, <laughs> they turned hijack down and then later on then they got signed to rhyme syndicate records and it was just like that was it but um i remember sitting in there and this guy came in like quite short black guy sat there all quiet he had a, like a stacks record 45 in his hands i'm looking at him i'm like I know you from somewhere. Where do I know you from? And it was D Nice in Boogie Down Productions. He yeah. was working on his solo album in Battery Studios. And I was just like, shit. 
it's like totally starstruck but i was like really quiet at the time and i was like I didn't yeah. say anything to it <laughs> But yeah, but it was like that. It was like you bump into these random people going through there all the time. Um, and then moving on, moving on, the sort of contract ran out. Um, our manager ripped us off, um, started a popcorn business. He took, he basically, all the money he got off from us, uh, he went on and made a uh, uh, American style popcorn business. And if you were in South London uh, around about 80, 80, 80, 89, 90, just about every shop in South London was stocking this popcorn. <laughs> I remember going to his factory and he had like piles and piles of this stuff. And I was getting, me and Eric were getting like real crappy royalty checks, like 30 pounds every <laughs> some shit like that. It was just like, you know, whatever. It, you but know. at the time we did, we didn't know we signed our contract uh, um, in Alfred's uh, in Alfred's kitchen. No legal representation. We were teenagers. Didn't know. We were like, oh, yeah, we're, we're signing a contract. Yeah, <laughs> but management contracts. And we took it to a lawyer afterwards, and he, uh, or a solicitor afterwards, and he was like reading through it, and he said, yeah, basically, there's a clause at the end of it. Say in all this legal jargon saying anything illegal in this contract is made legal by the signing of it. Some bullshit contract like that. And we were just like, yeah, yeah, we'll sign it. What the fuck? I'm a copper. That's <laughs> but, not even subtly deceptive though. That's like dark. Like, that's just, oh yeah. It was, it, yeah it was bullshit, it's just like, but it's what it is, do you know what I mean? It's like we were teenagers. We didn't have a clue what we were doing. Mm. We just wanted to make a record. Yeah. That was it, you know. So, um, you know, luckily, there's so much information out there now that people <laughs> aren't getting screwed over as much. Yeah, or but, record deal. <laughs> yeah, but back then, it was just like, we didn't know. <laughs> we just like, yeah, we were signing in your kitchen. But, um... The last person we talked to was uh, Eggsy, and he was saying, like, he reckons they were one of the last people to get offered, like, an old-school record deal where they actually still chuck stupid money at you and everything. Yeah. Obviously, that has kind of dissolved massively now, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. How much yeah. do you change since all the way back then until, like, today in terms of artists being on a record label or not or being independent, etc.? Do you know what? These days... <laughs> It's, the way I see it, record labels are becoming obsolete. Yeah. You a, 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 A. <laughs> Apart from independent ones, yeah. you know what I mean? Big ones. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, little ones. No, that's what I mean. It's like guys like you. Yeah, no. You know what I mean? It's like little independent. It's back to the independence again. You know? Yeah. And then independents have all the power these days, where it seems like. There always used to be the tastemakers, but then the bigger labels will step in and take all their talent. But now, yeah, no, now it's a different world. Big ones. It's definitely a different world, isn't it? Um, yeah. Internet age and obviously independency and being able to put out your own. I mean, I can't imagine like if you, when it was a thing to get a record deal. That that was the only kind of option. Do you know what I mean? It was the only road. Yeah. So, well, I can't imagine. Goal. I can't imagine what that would be like now, because I'm just not of that generation i mean uh, but that, that was the goal back then it was like you know get a record deal get record out get famous which it never really works that way for a lot of people but but yeah but <laughs> that's the thing it's like you know like i said we were teenagers we signed this deal didn't know what the hell we were doing but it's what it is you know? and how then, old were you I was 19, Eric was 17. So you were 19 and 17 when you signed the, the, the deal with Jive? Yep. That's mad. That's what I mean. Eric was <laughs> one even 18. He, was, he shouldn't even... He, said, he couldn't even drink. That's worth getting ripped off for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you moved back to Cardiff once the deal well, had gone, gone to shit and then what was your next moves musically? Post well, that. the contract ran out. Like, like I said, 
we were we were making friends at Jive and stuff like that. So we made friends with um, Danny D. He's like a producer from back in the eighties. Dancing Danny D. Used to go. He had a group called D Mob that um, had a couple of tracks in the charts and stuff. But he was producing uh, tracks with Wee Papa. Um, and Wee Papa's manager Trenton was sort of getting to know us and stuff as well. Um, Eric wrote a track for the Wee Papa's album. And uh, what's it called? Um, a group of MCs is called by We Pap Go Rappers, and it's good. It's a shout. I got a shout out on there and all sorts of shit. But um, but through that, through us knowing all of those people, um, I moved back. To, the contract went out. I moved back to Cardiff. Eric um, ended up going into Technotronic because Trenton became head of Rush Europe. You know, Rush Management in the states who had like Public Enemy. Um, L O Cool J, Run D M C, all of those. Um, well, it was a Rush Europe, and Trenton was mm-hmm. put in charge of Rush Europe, um, and they had Technotronic. They had um, it was. I don't know if you remember a group called London Rhyme Syndicate. But it, no. the, the, there's a uh, one of the rappers from London Rhyme Syndicate, KG Demo. He went solo, and they signed him. They signed DJ Crypt as a producer. Um, there was a few other acts they, they signed. But um, Eric, they were looking for a male rapper. And Eric sort of fit the bill. And they signed him to Technotronic. So, like, and then I had moved back. I had already moved back to Cardiff by that point because the contract had run out. Didn't really want to stay in London anymore. Um, and I started working in grassroots. Like before, when we were in grassroots, they didn't really have it. They didn't have a studio or anything. But when I moved back, they got grants to get this recording studio. It was probably like a lot of the stuff they still got there now. And uh, Paul Durant was put in charge of the studio. <clears throat> and uh, I went there working on an ET scheme for all the people who remember ET schemes. But it's the it tenor because I was on. I moved back. I didn't have a job, so I was on the door. And an ET scheme is is it was like people, people would say, "Oh, it's extra tenor because you did get an extra ten pound on top of your door to for doing it." <laughs> it was, right. It was, but it was it was, it was what it is. Um, yeah, and I uh, I started working in grassroots, and uh, they got me to help wire the studio up and. You know, just install everything. It was, it was, it was like Christmas because we were getting all. We had they had this grant money, and it was all these, this all this new equipment coming in, and putting it all together, and that. And then I started making demos and stuff for my friends. So like, Forty came down. I did a track for him. Um, there was another guy, Liam. I did a track with him. Um, it was just like a sort of like hip hop soul type track, and we had. Um, do you know, uh, you know Sean Evans who sings for Koshin? Yeah. Well, I used to go to school with her. And I said, oh, Sean, just jump on this track. And so she came down and sung on this track. I'd love to find it now, but I mean, it's gone. So it's, it's probably on a tape somewhere in the attic. But um, yeah, so she sang on that. There was a few other people came down. Um, was, uh, Bubba he used to go, come down to grassroots when he was young. He was like about ten years old, but he he, he came down. It was, and you know, we, we did bits and pieces down there. And then uh, I ended up leaving there, uh, and yeah, it just moved to Connaught Road. Not Connaught Roads. Is it Connaught Road? Yeah, Connaught Roads. And that was like a a little hub. Because Ford, he lived above me. I had bought the whole of the downstairs and no TV, just turntables and some furniture. Yeah, boy, sounds like my type of house. Yeah, and just practiced. Uh, and then some younger guys who I met through Ford, he knew from around, they started coming down to the flat. And it was like... Um, is Paul B, who later later on ended up being um, Associated Minds DJ, he's a DJ for Mudmouth and people like that. Um, yeah. 
And then there was uh, another guy, Andrew Alford, who goes under the name of Hoax, who's a graffiti writer. He does um, cruel, he's with Cruel Vapors. Um, but he was he's a DJ in hip hop years ago. And it, we used this. I used to have the chairs in my living room facing the turntables. And it was like school almost, because we, we used to have like um, break to the beat competitions in there. I'd, I'd like play a break beat in there to tell you who sampled it and stuff like that. It was, it was like taking them to school. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was just a weird time because everyone used to come through there. It was like Bubba and that used to come down. Um, and it just like old guys I knew from Lanish and used to come through. We used to have these parties every now and again. I had a party down there once and Paul Lyons was DJing in Lloyd's uh, and announced it over the mic that I was having a party. So I had everyone from the, the guy who used to walk around town selling flowers to, to uh, you name it. They, it was, just, <laughs> it was crazy. So what, what, what year are we in now? Well, we're in like... 91, 92, I'd say. We were talking. We were talking about a photo that popped up on the Cardiff Hip Hop Archive, but um, you know, it, you said it's been around for a while on Instagram with you DJing with is it Johnny B? Is that what you? Oh, Johnny B. So that's in some. So what's yeah, what's this Johnny. about St. Melons then? Enjoy, like in yeah, that. Right. So, so after Connaught Road, I moved to St. Melons, um, and. There was a youth project set up in St. Melons uh, for the, his sister, me, and there was a few other people sort of set it up, um, mainly sort of for the and his sister, but they set it, up, um, set it up. It was out of a house and it was getting kids interested in DJing, rapping, and like not so much b-boying, but street dance type stuff. Um, and we used to put on, like, we used to go around uh, youth centres and put on shows in youth centres. We ended up getting grants, getting studio equipment, started making beats. There's an actual Underdogs album out there somewhere on tape. I don't know, like, I had one copy and it's disappeared. Um, and it's all produced by me. And then um, I got, like, this kids rapping on it and it's I there's actually two tracks on there with me rapping on them. So hopefully Is it? So hopefully Is it? Uh where's this at? Come on. I'll tell you this right. I I Give can't a link. I I I I I kinda of don't know where they are. Honestly. I lost my I have one copy, I've lost it. So if anyone's got one, you know, here will, we go. Will you will you do a verse on the next Culture Vultures album? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I I, well, I pay you 50 I'll quid. I'll tell you why I rapped on it, right? It's because there was one of the guys who couldn't rap on beat. And I, I kept on, like, he'd, he'd rap, and I was, like, banging the walls, like, bam, bam, rap to that. This is how you, you know, and stuff like that to get him. He got it in the end, but then I said, right, okay, I don't rap. I'm not a rapper. I'm going to rap. So I wrote a couple of raps and I, I ended up rapping, uh, I ended up doing a solo track and I think I was on another one with two other rappers, two other kids. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not a rapper, so don't, please don't ask me to rap because I, I can't. What if I, what if I pay you? This is coming soon. No, no money, no money. <laughs> There's no money. I'm not going to do it. Um, but anyway. There's definitely a certain amount of money you'll rap a bit. Yeah. I just don't have that amount of money. You're not going to not drop a 16. It's like, I'll try, it's like my, my daughter's into like a lot of UK acts and stuff. And then, you know, and she, she'll spit the verses straight. She, she's really good. She's memorized it all and just spit it straight. And then I'll just have a go at it. And she just looks at me like, Dad, this don't. <laughs> <laughs> what does she listen to out of interest? Um, she listens to who's who is it? She, oh, she went to see AJ. She loves AJ Tracy. She went to see, and that was AJ Tracy was her first gig. Um, then she likes she she's all right with H. She loves Dave. Just all you know, all that side of it. She like she's she like that gets tune that uh, Mozambique tune that came out. 
like, yeah. like thank you like that tune as well. It's, you know, yeah, it's a good tune. Like, Gats is get good. My kids sort of keep me sort of in the know with all stuff like that. Even though I sort of get I get sent a lot of it as well. So yeah. I, no how much you meet on their tastes and how much you differ does it is it always like oh yeah that's cool or is there like points where you're like this is trash <laughs> well the the littles the yeah. little mcs you know <laughs> uh some of them some of them she'll, she'll play some of the tracks i'm not you know at the end of the day it's not for me yeah so they don't really matter what my opinion is on, on it but some of it i'm listening i'm like oh no no that's that's all right that's pretty good and then some of it, I'm like, nah, this is just trash. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, but, but it, on the whole, it's like, we're, we're pretty on par with our music taste. It's like, like my, my 17 year old, she'll, she turned me on to um, Reggie Snow and I really like Reggie Snow stuff and like uh, Georgie and um, what else? It? Like Brockhampton, she was putting me on to Brockham Brockhampton and stuff like that. Mm. That's her sort of style. She's into all of that. Now, like I said, my younger one, she's into more of the UK stuff. Yeah. So I guess this like this conversation is often very boring with a lot of people, but I feel like this is actually a good time to ask the question as you've actually lived through so much rap history of like, what do you think are the main changes in it? And is there a particular time or nub you think it was stood above the rest? Would you think it... It is what it is, and it moves with the time. Nah, it's all got its merits. It's the main differences. The main difference is, is like, well, it can, it goes in cycles as far as I'm concerned. It's like, like when it first came out, you know, the Grandmaster Flash was wearing like high heel boots and leather and stuff like that, and now you got the the Lils wearing. Yeah. Yeah, and clothes and stuff like that so everything sort of goes in cycle it's like um when it came out it was like they were using like live instrumentation and stuff and then you got years later you got the roots used who were live groups and stuff like that so it all switches around but it's like for me it's like uh, like i'm I'm 52 in a few years a few, few weeks yeah a lot of people my age are like oh music's crap now it's all the same it's all the same yeah but all they do is listen to what's on the radio. Yeah. I never listen to the radio. Yeah. You know what I mean? It all, it all has its own... Um, I feel like everything has its own avenue. I hate, I hate when people hate music for it not being a different type of music. That's like my pet hate. It's, it's like, oh, the 90s was so much better. Yeah, we'll go and listen to the 90s then, isn't it? Like, do... <laughs> it's... It's, it's a ridiculous argument. I, I remember sitting down with someone and they were arguing with me saying the Neptunes weren't hip hop and stuff. And I was just like, what? Okay. Bro, in it. I mean, I didn't even want to bring this guy up because he doesn't fucking warrant our attention. But just that guy on the on the Facebook group yesterday ranting at me because uh, DJs aren't musicians. <laughs> I was just like, bro. So hilarious. How many, the first... how many times have you heard that in your career? Like, how many times has someone. Count. Yeah, I have lost count. And did you get pulled into just... that whole guitar versus turntable thing as well, <laughs> which was obviously a market employed by Pioneer and Technic and, oh, yeah. and Fender? I was on a TV program years ago, and it was like um, one of these Welsh magazine programs, and they were asking about like scratching and stuff. And I said in that interview, I said, like scratching for me is is, is like playing a guitar. Yeah, because there's different fingering you use, different, you know, and it's the same thing. And it's like on all these and all um all these bands I've been in, all these groups I've been in, just to do cuts for them. I've always been looked at as a musician, because I'm adding this other musical element to it. So that guy saying, "Oh, you know, they only play their own music." I'm like, "Well, I'm scratching something. It doesn't matter what it is, a sound or anything like that." And I'm adding this extra layer yeah. to, to an extra texture, same way as like a rhythm guitar has its texture or whatever, you know, any other instrument. So to me, it, it, it's, it's silly. It's just petty. Oh, it's so yeah. silly. I just I just love how angry the, this guy got at the fact that I posted uh, 
I was, and then, like, I was, he was going off at me, like, I was like, well, he's a D, I was like, obviously, I went through, well, you know, DJs are musicians, there's like scratching as a, you know, turntables are an instrument, scratching as a culture, all this shit. And he went, and then, like, and he was like, yeah, but you're not interviewing him as a producer, though, are you? You're interviewing him as a DJ. And I was like, how the fuck do you know how I'm interviewing him? I was like, I'm interviewing him as both. Like, you don't even, you obviously don't know the first thing about DJs. So now you're telling me, if I'm specific, just because you've got DJ in front of your name, he obviously does not get like, like in a in a way, I feel a bit sorry for him because you know I mean? it's like you obviously yeah. have not been exposed to this type of music or culture, That's but it doesn't give you the right to be a dick about it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. It's just people with like, just you need you know open your mind a little bit and dig a bit. It's like like going back like you know, about the music and stuff and about the different eras. It's like I've I just started getting hip hop in the early eighties. And like, you know, just say step come out, amazing, you know, stuff like that. Go into the nineties, you got the like the mob deeps and stuff and the like the Wu Tangs and all that. Into the two thousands you got like all the Neptune stuff and anything. I embrace it all. At the end of the day it all comes from the same place. So and you yeah. know and for the music to for music to survive and thrive. It's got to change. You can't, you know, granted, now there's still stuff that sounds like 90s stuff, like 90s music. That's great. You know, I play a lot of it on my show, but, you know, there's also all these other things. You've got to have balance, basically. There's all these other genres of, of hip hop. It's all hip hop. I don't care what. Yeah. There's all that. Sub- subcultures isn't it let's let's just stop for a second then because you just mentioned your show so what's your show for someone who might oh, have heard right. it? My, my radio show is um this that and the third it's a mix show one hour mix show i do um every fortnight on uh, rap Tees radio which is a radio station based in paris um and yeah it's on tonight actually nine o'clock is that- uh, <laughs> That. And if you went, if you weren't doing why I'm not going to be there because uh, it's pre-recorded. So that's, that's yeah. I had to check that before we went live because yeah, I was like, I have you got, yeah. a, have you got yeah. to jump off? <laughs> I knew he wasn't a real musician. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pre-records yeah. as well. Yeah, I do. I do like <laughs> you're the worst. You're on like, the worst. I pre-record it on like a Tuesday and then send it send it over and then they it, they broadcast it on the Wednesday then. I got I got so, something I got a question actually because um, firstly uh, David Cugini came back and he said it was night he thinks it was ninety one but um, yeah oh, there you go. we're going back a bit but um, I was just thinking like because you're talking about being surrounded by people with loads of different like skill sets you know you, like like you know the elements of hip hop like so you were obviously crossing paths with loads of people and like yeah. you know you mentioned Ronnie One already who's now like who's been doing print and like working the scene for years like and like being like having the parties and on in his place and that but um i was just wondering was there a particular like um magazine or something or like that you all kind of were like into how to get every issue or that you it was Um, kind of like your your aim to get into or was there something that was representing cardiff's history or hip-hop at the time Earlier on in the 80s, there was like uh, Street Sounds Records put out a, a, um, a magazine called Streets. I think it was called Street Scene or something like that. And I remember it, it was the first sort of magazine I ever read and it had like, a hip hop chart in it. Um, but then later on, obviously, it was Hip Hop Connection. That was mm. really the only one around that, that, you know, that we sort of gravitated to. Um, and then it was like later on, then we'd get the source. And then XXL, but it's to be honest, you know, I think HJC Hip Hop Connection that that was the only one that we really like. Oh yeah, it'd be great to get in there. Mm. Where was that based? I think it was in London. Was that? Because I remember Rough Styles was a writer for it. Rough Styles, who like he was associated minds crew. Um, like he he was a writer for it because I remember. Like I'm jumping around all over the place here, but Urban Poets, um, my group, he interviewed us uh, for uh, for the uh, Hip Hop Connection, only because his his editor said to interview us because we had won this competition. I'll, I'll get to it, but anyway, but yeah, he used to write for him, and so I, I suppose Hip Hop Connection was the only one really 
you know, I'm, I'm sure that someone else is going to say, oh, well, but what about this one? But I, that's the only one I really sort of read. And then later on the source and stuff. But Yeah. Would you say there's moments then like that you can sort of like tick off that, like, you know, you achieve something like you, did you set goals or did you just allow it to happen? Like or? we just did it. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, there was no, that's the thing. It was first, there was no real blueprint. We were just like, yeah, we want to rap. We want to record music. We want to put it out there. We know we knew about record deals because, you know, I've, I've got one when we're in London. Um, but it was basically that, you know, and it's like, like with the, um, with the underdogs, now that's going back to that, um, we didn't really have a goal of a record deal with that. It was basically just for the kids because, you know, St. Mallon's just, the estate is pretty like shitty estate, really. you know, it was, it was in, uh, like the kids wanted, it's needed something to do. So we sort of did that, gave them this, uh, you know, gotten into a dance competitions and stuff like that, which still went on after I had left. You know, they they were they were heavily into the dance scene. Um, but yeah, that was there was no sort of goal of like record deal or anything like that. But then going back to Johnny B, like Johnny B comes from the underdogs. He was a kid who came and wanted a rap. Uh, he went on then to do his own thing. Uh, there was uh, Nathan, who went to the name Nathan the Watcher. He was in the underdogs. He was just a kid who used to ride back and forth down the street. And one day we just like, oh, you know, do you want to come in and check this out? And so he came into the house and he ended up being a pretty good rapper. So he went on then and uh, was in a group with another guy who was in the end, Dos Sparky and Fordy, and we had a group called the Shawnees. Um, yeah, I, is that how it's pronounced? I was trying to read that earlier. I wasn't quite sure how it was pronounced. Yeah, yeah, Johnny, Shawnees. I, I, I'm not sure. It was Fordy who came up with the name. Apparently, it's some like something like Welsh warrior or something like that. I'm, I haven't got a Shawnees. Clue. But I, I, yeah, I was, I was just like, yeah, okay, yeah. You like it, I love it. Brilliant. Right, okay, that's the name. Um, but we ended up going to it's just some random stuff, but they went to Berlin and there's a guy they met in Berlin who was like a writer and he loved how they put their rhymes together and stuff. And he loved like stories about people. So they came back and he the pay, he said, you'll pay for them to go back over with me as long as we sit down and just go through our life story and, you know, and then write some rap, they, they then write some raps and stuff like that. So he paid for us to go over, he put us up there and we just had a ball. We just ended up going out, meeting all these different um, artists. Like there was a, there's a crew over in Berlin called Chiba Garden. Um, we were hanging with them. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys who's, who was a guest rapper on Sheep Garden's album, we had to hang around with him and his girlfriend. He was a rapper. She was a graffiti artist. Uh, they shared a flat together. Both had separate record collections on either side of the room. And they, they'd come over, like, she'd come over, oh, I see this album, I love this album. And she'd like hugging it and stuff. And then we'd, we'd be chilling there and then it'd be like two in the morning and she'd be like, right, I'm going out now. I'm like, where are you going? I'm going on a train. Okay, <laughs> but and then they take us to like they had a cafe, uh, and it was sort of something like the hip hop shop or something like that. And it was like kids there just doing graffiti. There's deck set up there, and it was it was like a youth club. But but one thing we noticed over there, it was like they treated us like we we just had a couple of demos, not even properly recorded. But they treated us like superstars because we were from the UK. And they treat yeah. people from the UK and people from the US, they treat them exactly the same. Mm. But every right. person we met over there had an album out or a single out or something like that. They had something out. They had they were all like signed, whether it was independent labels or whatever, they were all signed. But they were looking at us like we were the superstars and they were like, We ain't doing shit, mate. <laughs> it's like But yeah, yeah it's uh, and I I ended up DJing in this club 
called um, the Akud Club. And it was basically like, um, say you walk up to a like, tower block of flats, go into the door and go down to the basement, and that was the club. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the toilets were like on the first floor. But the club was like a makeshift club. It was like uh, <laughs> wood nailed to the wall with octaves on it, graffiti all over the place, a little stage in the corner. And uh, lucky for me, there was um, the biggest tune at the time was this, was a tune by, I can't remember the name of it, but it was by Gemini, the gifted one. And that was the biggest tune in Berlin's hip hop scene at the, at the time. And I had a remix of it on some bootleg vinyl. And uh, I play my set and everyone was sort of like, you know, yeah, all right. And I dropped the remix and the club just went nuts. <laughs> it's just like, oh shit, okay. So uh, yeah, we were just hang, hanging out with people then. And then we walked outside. I remember <laughs> that, crazy. We walked outside and these bottles started smashing on the floor. I'm like, what the hell's going on? But there was these skinheads at the opposite flats. And they were shouting down like white power and all this shit and just chucking bottles. <laughs> and one of the guys who we were with, I was like, I was like, oh shit, we better go and all that. And one of the guys who was like, oh, fuck that. He went <laughs> in the door of the flat, went up there and just started threatening them. He's kind of like, okay, chill, you know, we don't want to get in any trouble in that. But, but yeah, and then, uh, yeah, we were just, I, there's a, I took a video recorded over with me and I'd love to find that cassette because there was some <laughs> crazy shit. I got attacked by his my one of the guys over there, his dog called Rousey. And there's a, I remember there's video footage I'm filming of that and Rousey soon comes running up and jumping on me. I'm like, yeah yeah chill Rousey. Rousey, chill, chill Rousey. Oh, and then I just go back. <laughs> but yeah, it's random shit. But um <laughs> yeah and then anyway, get back on topic. But <laughs> We, you know, uh, I, was, go on. I was just going to say, um, from what you said there, it sounds like Berlin hip hop was very vibrant at the time. Oh, at the time, it was amazing. So, would you say it was more vibrant than London? And also, saying that encounter with uh, the white supremacists or whatever, was there an obvious counter to the vibrancy of hip hop? Was there still an obvious repressive, racist? Feeling or was that a freak occurrence? Sort of nah, that was. I was talking to the guys and they said, "Nah, they just did it. <clears throat> they were just yeah. basically like, we don't even bother with those people. They're, they're no stress to us at all. Yeah, you know, they, they were like a almost a minority. Yeah, yeah. So, fucking hate minorities. <laughs> what's that? I'm joking. I was saying I hate minorities, the skinhead <laughs> racists. <laughs> but no, but that's it. They they said it's. <laughs> It was just like, you know, they were just a small group of people. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. So, yeah, but, but the, no, the hip-hop scene, <laughs> like, the area we were staying in, um, there was a crew called the 36ers. Um, from what I got told over there, it's like all the younger ones were like graffiti artists and they just bombed the hell out of everywhere. And then they sort of go up a bit higher and they get into a little bit of, crime and whatever and then all the older ones are like coke dealers and like <laughs> and shit and it's like you'd see them like the the, the older guys sitting it was like something out of the out of place uh the godfather they'd be sitting outside cafes drinking their little cups of coffee and then my chapters like, over there and another guy over there with their sort of hands in their jackets like this and you're like oh shit but but you see it everywhere over there. It was just like 36, 36, 36, everywhere. It's crazy. Yeah. But um, but then we we sort of moved back. We came back from there and everyone was hyped. We're like, right, we gotta, you know, we gotta do stuff now, we gotta get this going. And then it just went fizzled. It was just like every time we'd sort of like say, Oh, you know, we need to get together, they're like, Yeah, 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 yeah. And no, nah, nothing. So, um, and about that time as well, then I was sort of, I started sort of DJing, doing the odd gig, like that Vibe Tribe thing came up and did that. Um, I'm trying to think, what, which year was this? But it was 90s again. I'm 
God forgive me, I'm nearly 52 and my mind is turning to mush. But, <laughs> but uh, I think now, yeah. we, shall we stop for some questions from the audience? From yeah, the, yeah, definitely. Because like we've got a few coming in. I know that like we've been talking for over an hour, so I don't know. Like Ricardo Banks asked one right at the very beginning. Um, so I'll, I'll ask it now just so that he's not holding on too long. Uh, so it says, uh, what makes you take notice of other DJs? Is it skills, song selection, general vibe, or telling a story with the set itself? How does he, how do you approach your own sets? What advice would you give to other less experienced DJs? That's a lot right. of questions. Um, well, I say my top three DJs are um, J-Rock, Jazzy Jeff, and then... Um, Probably Premier for three different reasons. Um, so this is what I look for in other DJs. It's like J-Rock, uh, he doesn't care what he plays as long as it sounds good. Um, the way he plays his music as well is very it's interesting. It's an interesting style. It's very, he manipulates the records very well. Um, so for me, I loved watching him just for the interesting side of what he's doing because you never know what he's, what's coming next. Um, then obviously, part, and then Party Rock inside of it, Jazzy Jeff. It's like I've never seen him or heard a set that he's done that I just want to go and dance because he, he just he knows what he's doing. You know, what I mean, he's, he, he, he is the ultimate party rocker as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then with uh, with Primo, it's the way his style is what, how I play my records on my radio show. I love the fact that he's he still cuts up and stuff but and it's not it's it's a basic style but it's still it's like real sort of essence of hip hop if you know what i mean yeah 100 percent. yeah um but then you put all three of those together and that's why i'm looking for in a dj someone who manipulates the records well you don't know what he's gonna play um can rock a party keep it going it's like People say to me like well, about turntablism and stuff like that. I don't ca I don't class myself as a turntablist. I got nothing against turntable turntablists. I love them. You know what I mean? I. But I. I prefer to DJ to people. I feed off energy of people. Um. I can't. I I I, I can't really explain what it is, but it's just like. I, I just, I do get I just get a buzz off watching people get off on what I'm playing and stuff. But um, sorry, what was the other questions he asked? And the last <laughs> one, it, well, I mean, you kind of answered how do you approach your own sets. But you've answered that. Um, I approach, uh, yeah. It's kind of like you said that you try and get all that together. Yeah, and then the well, last last thing well, was what advice would you give to other less experienced DJs? Don't listen to anything ever any, any other DJ tells you. <laughs> <laughs> that's good no because i know it's like i grew up in an era where like i know i'm doing my old man thing now but i grew up in an era where there was no youtube there was no videos you basically had to listen to things work it out yourself and then sometimes you'd work it out but it'd be wrong so what's your hearing but it'd still work so what i'm saying what i'm trying to say is do your own thing if you think it sounds good and you think it'll work and <coughs> you've seen other DJs play and you know how they'll, they work or whatever. And then you do something and you think it's original, like wordplay, um, I don't know, like, like any, any like sort of uh, tra weird transitions, anything like that. If you work that out yourself and you think, yeah, that uh, that'll definitely work because of what you've seen or what you've heard or whatever in the, in the past, but it's your own, own original stuff. Just go with that. Because that's, that's the thing. It's like, I remember when I used to go out clubbing with my, with my wife, when we, when we were first together, she used to hate me. Yeah, that's weird. My wife's ringing me now. <laughs> but 
Yeah. 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 Don't talk about me on the live stream, like yeah. it's private. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> when I used to go out clubbing with her, she used to hate it because I used to predict what the DJ was playing all the time. I was like, oh yeah, he's, he's going to play that next. And she's, she's like, oh shit, no, he's not. And then he'd play that record. And I'm predicting because you, you sort of, there was a lot of DJs around who were sort of just formulated. And then that seems to be sort of a lot of, a lot of people do the same sort of thing now. It's like they look at other DJs and they think, oh, well, that works, so I'll do that. Instead of trying to work out something themselves. You know what I mean? I was watching that live at Larry's thing from like 2019, Breaking in the Bay. And there's that, yeah. that wicked little interview of you where you're literally like, you're, you're DJing and doing the interview at the <laughs> same time. Almost like, you know, this is what I do in my sleep. And yeah, you can interview me at the same time. But you said yeah. Yeah, at the end of that, it doesn't matter how technical, it's like it's about reading the crowd, right? It's what you yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's what I mean. It's like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I get a buzz off the crowds because it's like you, you read it and if people, if people are feeling what you're doing, it gives you that extra boost and then you sort of take it in another direction. And I love, I love throwing curveballs in so it's into my sets as well. It's like just going to how I approach my sets. I, like club-wise, I love throwing curveballs in where... Like, I do a lot of virtual digging and stuff. So, um, oh, hold on a sec. Yeah. No, he's coming home at half past. Right. Sorry, family business. Um, <laughs> family man. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say then? Yeah, I do a lot of like virtual digging on SoundCloud, blogs back in the day, all sorts of things like that. Finding weird, obscure sort of remixes edits, anything like that. So I like throwing, like, like if there's a, a, um, an edit of something or a remix of something, but it's like, they'll, they'll know either the music or they'll know the vocals, but then it just sort of twists it around a bit. So it's like, I'll play something and it's got like a, um, a, a recognizable break in it or something they might know, and then someone else will come in so I, got, I, I get sent like um, edits. Uh, there's a guy called Nick Bike, and uh, I got sent an edit he did of um, you know Greatest Dancer. Yeah, he's the greatest dancer. That one. Yeah. Uh -huh, but, it's uh -huh. like, but it's like the music of it, and then all of a sudden, No La Ledge by Rakim will come in, and it's just like. So I love I love stuff like that, and I like doing like wordplay, where it's like I'll I'll play like the youngsters um, past the mic, and then go into um, uh, what's it called Mass Appeal, is it Mass Appeal? Yeah, Mass Appeal by Gangstar and stuff. Gangstar. Yeah, yeah. I use that to cut, and or use like original samples first, and then go into the the, the people who sampled it, and all stuff like that. It's just making your sets interesting. Because, you know, you, the, especially these days, anyone can just go and download the top 10 hits on one extras chart or whatever and then go and play them back to back. It's, it's not rocket science anymore. But when you're sort of making your set interesting and people, you know, pick their ears up a bit more. And it's, yeah, 100%. Um, uh, any more questions? There are more, yeah. Have you guys got anything? What, what, I got what? one. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brave McGraw. Shout out to Brave McGraw. He's asking, um, I'm guessing you've probably got a lot of answers for this one because it probably differs, yeah. but what song do you use to end a DJ set? What song do I use to end a DJ set? Yeah, I'm guessing that's not one specific no. song in it, but Every that is time. the question. <laughs> in 85, I've used... <laughs> oh. Or is there any specific play, songs that you would use to end the DJ set? Any killers you'd? It's like when I, I used to DJ awesome. in 10 feet tall and uh, every set, I played there for like six, six years, seven years, something like that. I used to play on a Friday and every set I'd end with um, Everybody Loves the Sunshine over oh, years. Have you heard the flip yeah. by, um, I think it's Joey Badass, Shine? No, I haven't. Oh Did my he God, it? he flipped it. And I was Did like, no it? one can flip that. That's, you know, that's a classic and he flipped it. And it oh, is, yeah. it's, it's bad, man. It's in, as in good, man. But yeah. No, right. <laughs> it's, as in good. Anyway. 
Yeah, yeah, you should check it. I'll, I'll, Joe, Joey Badass Shine, it's called. I'll find it now. I think I've listened to that track as well. I don't think I realised he'd flipped it. Yeah, so, I've heard that track and not even clocked it was a flip. So, <laughs> shame on me. But I used to, yeah, I used to finish Tempe Tour with that. Um, I think it is not... A lot of other places, I don't really... It's just whatever. But I think mean, Tempe Tour was the only one that I'd really use that because... It's a really good track, and I used to play upstairs. And to be honest, it was just to slow everything down so people would start going downstairs so the bouncers didn't have like, too much of a harder job. But it's functional. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, nothing special. It's just whenever. whenever yeah. so if, if, if someone said, obviously, you don't play one thing for anything, would you a DJ? But like, start of the set, first track. What's the first track that comes to your head now that something you might have? played regularly or recently at the start of your set? That I play at the start of my set or? Yeah. Oh. Just like, what's the last one you remember dropping at the start of a set? What did I play last Saturday? I think it was, it was some old 90s R&B tune I played first last Saturday. I can't remember what one it was. It might be Star, uh, Starship by, I think it's a Daz band or something like that, but I really can't remember. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, but I, I'm telling you what I played, the, the first tune I played on my radio show, which was Spoiler. Ramson Babbo's new one. That was the oh, first yeah. tune. So that was the first tune I played tonight. So. Ramson Babbo. So yeah. We, yeah, okay. So I've got yeah. a new tune called Aqua. And that's uh, all, it's going to be live at nine o'clock, yeah? Is that yeah. British summertime or is that Fr France time? British no, no, nine o'clock British time. So, yeah. That's me. Um, um, something I'd like to touch on as um, we just recently released, there we go, Black Tricks EP. Yeah. On Winger Records. And it also features cuts by DJ Jaffa on the Fracas remix, if I'm correct. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah. I wasn't sure. I wasn't it's sure release, it, which, 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 which yeah, no, but there's two versions of the song. I wasn't sure if he did it on the on the original or the. Well, like, I he um, just sent me a he sent me a track. I think it was the original he sent me, and I did the cut on the original, and I just he just transferred it to the remix. So. To the remix. Yeah. Okay, so with Black Tricks, isn't it? Black Tricks is obviously a, a well-known name in the Welsh hip hop scene. And obviously this is his comeback like um about seven years he's since he's released music i think and obviously he's back with a bang how long have you known black tricks and um what uh yeah what's your relationship I, I, there this time i met him it must have been like higher learning days so it's like mid mid to late 90s i suppose like yeah that. but yeah um but yeah, I've known him like because I he used to hang around with like uh, Humor Rack as well, and like he lived right down the road uh, from me on well down Wichert Roadway, so I'd bump into him every now and again. I remember he saw me DJ with Cash Money, um, and this is before he started rapping, and that was the first time he ever spoke to me. So it came up to oh safe set, you know, and I was like oh what is it, you know? but yeah, that was that's. So I ran about like mid no whatever whatever the start of higher learning was. Yeah. Um so I think he used to go there. Um but yeah, I've known him for quite a while. I got a question yeah. from uh Reese, which is actually touching upon higher learning, but um it says he's asking you, um, what was the best era of Welsh hip hop? Or is it as lively now as ever, just with less nights like the higher learning and venues like the old Toucan, et cetera, to embrace it? Night-wise, I think, yeah, higher learning days was amazing because it, it was a lot of things going on. It was like you had higher learning, you had like hustlers in Wilds Club, you had like uh, things going on in like Callahan's and that. It was, it was a place where Cardiff Bus Station um, used to be. There was a little place right at the end where it was like a cafe and then the other end there was a place you could hire out i can't even remember what it was called but we used to have jams in there um we had jams in Cate's community center 
all over the place. So there was loads going on. Um, so I loved that era because everything was sort of new. But then, like, obviously now, like COVID and stuff, there's not as many jams going on, but the actual scene itself is amazing. Popping, yeah. You know what I mean? There's so much music coming out. Yeah. So I got, I got a yeah, question we, actually off the back of that from Ben Radford because he actually mentions now like COVID and that. And as you mentioned it, we might as well jump in with that. He says, as you've been part of the live hip hop scene for so long, how do you see the future of Welsh live hip hop with so many venues being closed down? Also, do you have any thoughts on how live music can carry on since COVID's put a stop to almost all live events? Cheers, guys. Loving the interview. It's a big question, Mate, isn't it? I, I really don't know what the future holds for it. But if, you know, if, if everything goes back to normal, I, like you were saying about um, the future of Welsh hip hop and with the venues closing down, um, I got asked this question before, but just like pre-COVID. And like at the time, the Moon Club was stepping up. You know, it was putting on a lot of events in, in there. Um, and then there was like the Ink Spot place down by... What's it called? Broadway, down by that way. That was started to put nights on. It was Loco started to put nights on. So I just said, I said in the interview before, I said, look, it's, it's like Jurassic Park. Life finds a way. And, you know, if people want to party, they will find venues. They will find, like, places out of town. They'll, it's like Cate's Community Centre. That's another one which, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, my old Ed Townend has put stuff on in there for Junior Bill and that. And like back in the day, we used to put stuff on in there. So it's I don't I don't really sort of harp on the negative side of all oh, the venues are closing down. It's really bad, and I wish it wasn't happening. But if it does happen, we'd find a way push through it and you know, the venues smaller venues and stuff like that and then the thing is it's like when places like that uh start getting big people will come you know it's, and if they want to if they want to support a scene they will make the make the the track just out of town and do it so yeah that's that's my that's my that's my way of looking at it i'm more on a positive side of life yeah. the way the yeah. music is is really Finds a way. That's sick. I going, mean, uh, go on. <laughs> no, just going through um, just your Facebook bio alone is pretty fucking deep, isn't it? Yeah. But just to I mean, I mean, just, on a <laughs> just to say uh, on the DJ side of supporting people, I'll try and find it now. So your list is, I mean, the top top list is Grandmaster Flash, Cool Herc. Africa Bab Batter, yeah. Grand Wizard oh, Theodore, Cash Money, Snoop Dogg, Cool Keith, Guru of Gangstar, JS1, Razel, Blade, Jest, Million Dan, Gunshot, Jungle Brothers, Rasco, Planet Asia. I'm getting out of breath, just saying. <laughs> Master Ace, Public Enemy, People Under the Stairs, Ugly Duckling, A Skills, DJ Hurricane, Ghostface, and more. Yes. Is. is that alone is probably a podcast in itself, but any of those are, are top draw gigs or like yeah, the big... guru one? Because I was, yeah, I was DJing for like Eric went on to do the Technotronic thing, but then he sort of reinvented himself as Me One. Um, he he's got a track on the Me One album with Little Da, um, and that's and he it was produced. I think it was. Produced it was produced by Guru or something like that. Was this connection with Guru? Um, but Guru was doing the jazz, Jasmine, uh, Jasmine has, yeah, Jasmine yeah, has, yeah. and uh, he asked Eric to support. So Eric asked me to DJ for him. Um, now it was amazing. So I Where met, was that? That was in uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire. Right. Um, I met Guru, which was it was working. We went in the beginning of the day. Guru walked over, he was like, oh, Eric. And Eric said, oh, this is, I'm with DJ Jaffa, blah, 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 blah. I met him. He's really short. Oh, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I met him. Um, 
But then they were sound checking, so we went up to the dressing rooms, and we were coming down, and we were walking onto the stage, and then Guru came over to me. He was like, oh, yo, Jeff, this is my man Herbie. And he introduced me to Herbie Hancock. No. I was like... Uh. <laughs> no, I don't I don't really get starstruck because I just look at them, you know, they're people. Yeah. But, but that time I was I was just like, okay, <laughs> um, I've got to go over there and sound. I just didn't know what to say to him. And he was so nice. He came over, oh, how are you doing? I'm I'm Herbie. I was like, I know you are, mate. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that was an amazing gig. And then afterwards, like I met Courtney Pine. Um who else I knew? Oh, it was a singer. I can't remember her name. <laughs> but, but yeah, it was, it was an amazing night. Maybe uh, we could use that to segue into um, you going to New York and doing work out there as we're on. Okay. Um, There's a situation around you going to New York. What did you get up to? Right. Except well, years later, I was in a group called Kids With Toys. Well, first of all, I was in a group called Manchild. Um, which were basically like um, Chemical Brothers and Prodigy mixed together, came up with Man Child. Um, Is this Prodigy the group or Prodigy the rapper? No, Prodigy the group. <laughs> okay. I was um, I was a DJ. Nathan, who was in the underdog, uh, Underdogs years before and in Urban Poets and all that, he went on to be the front man, sort of MC for him. Did a load of gigs and stuff with that. Um, and then the drummer, Rich, um, me and him got together after Manchild had sort of split up and we started a group called Kids With Toys. And it was almost like a comedy sort of group. We had, we did a gig in London. We had Eggsy, um, on stage with us actually at this gig in London. So, Is it? Yeah, it was, uh, cause we had a track called Coke Boy and it was basically, we, had this there was a friend of Rich's who, who was a comedy writer and he basically did this skit um of an A&R guy and we sort of recorded it sampled it and chopped it up so we and sped it up in places so it sounded like he was going really fast and talking on coke and blah, 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 all this sort of thing and put it over this um over this hip-hop track and I was cutting on it and stuff so we had Eggsy pretend to be coke boy on stage <laughs> Mate, that is... and yeah, he had a bag of flour and he just went <laughs> in his head face <laughs> and his... Yeah, and uh, we had a few tracks like that comedy sort of tracks they yeah. were comedy but it was, it was we had a decent mc we, you know it was it was really sort of decent hip-hop but it was like like we had a track yeah. called chocolate and um the rapper was going on like like he was rapping about a woman, but in a, using the metaphor of chocolate, like saying, "Oh, you're silky smooth," like this, or, or, or sort of stuff like that. But then at the end of it, he actually was rapping about chocolate, and he raps the last verse with chocolate in his mouth and blah, 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 all this. Sort of this. <laughs> I don't know where it all came from, but yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, fast forwards, we sort of that sort of fell by the wayside, but me and Rich still left the production. So we, we started a production team called The Kids, just me and him. Um, he had a friend who was working in New York, working with this guy called Ken Lewis. Um, you know who Ken was at the time, uh, but then she sort of got in touch with Rich and said, look, um, I'm working with this guy. There's a track that we and me and you started years ago. Is there any chance you could come over to New York? So he was of all Emin and R and that, and then we found out who Ken Lewis was, and me and him booked our tickets that day. Because Ken Lewis is, uh, he's he was um, a mix engineer, went into production. He's worked with. Jay-Z, Kanye, Mary J. Blige, Ghostface, you name it, he's worked with them. Um, you, you walk into his studio, which is in the upstairs in his house, you walk up the stairs and it's like platinum disc, platinum disc, gold disc, platinum disc, gold disc. He mixed Just Blaze's first ever beat. Um, he's like, he was like 
top tier. You know what I mean? It was like shit. And he does like sample recreations and stuff like that as well for records. So there's records out there that you might hear and you think, God, oh, they sampled it, but he's, he's just recreated the sample. Um, so we went over to New York um, and through all of that, he, he basically sat in his studio, like little kids listening to his stories. He was teaching us different techniques with our production. Um, and we got on really well with him. And then he ended up putting beats forward for us to different record labels in the States, which is really hard to get through. Um, and then he got us uh, a gig with this guy called Id um, Idro. He's a rapper from Washington, DC. He's the executive producer on the album was LES, who was Nas's DJ. Uh, and we had the first single on the album. Um, so yeah, we all, that was all through going over there. But when we were in New York, it was just, yeah, it was studio all the time in the studio, working on beats there. He was just teaching us and all that. We ended up going to Platinum Sound Studio, which is Wyclef Studio. It was just, it was just going to the Mecca, do you know what I mean? Was, yeah. yeah. Hundred uh, percent. I love. I love to go to New York. Yeah. I'd love to go anywhere in America, but obviously New York has that rich hip hop heritage in it. So yeah, but that's it. And it's just like. So what? What's the if if I want to find that track? How do you spell? How do you spell Edro? Not. You're not going to find it. <laughs> I'm not going to find it. Because no, the album was made, and then it got shelved. So uh, oh, classic. But I might, never... I might just post it up on YouTube or something like that and stick yeah, it. You should do. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, he's he was, <laughs> he was a good rapper. It was a bit like the beat was a bit sort of like 50 Cent ish, but it's, <laughs> I mean, and we went to um, we went to a party in London, which the record label put on, and. I didn't drink at the time, but I had to because the, the guy who ran the label, he was minted and he was bringing out like bottle after bottle of Cristal. And I heard about Cristal on all these rap records and I never tasted it. So I was like, right, okay, I'm, I'm drinking it. <laughs> it was after the Urban Music Awards in London. And, um, oh, hold on a sec, my son. So. Oh, you're home, good. Right. Um, but yeah, it was after the Urban Music Awards in London. And um, we got taken to this club afterwards and it was like all in like blacked out SUVs and sort of walked into the club, <laughs> roped off area. And it was just like Cristal coming out, uh, Chinese food coming out. And it was, yeah, it was just, like me and Rich standing in the corner, these two kids from Cardiff, like, oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, it's, it was amazing, you know. But that, that all came off the back of like the New York thing. Yeah, that's crazy. We've got a question so, from the uh, Honest Poet. If I can. Uh, shout out to the Honest Poet. Oh, how are you doing? Big up. He says, what do you reckon will sway attention to the Welsh scene? Is it down to the level of how good the artist and the music or just more exposure to us all to be able to shine how we should? Obviously, the quality's got to be there. And like, honest poet, he's, he's definitely got the quality. His, yeah. his music's amazing. Yeah, man. And I think nowadays it's not as bad as what it used to be when it's like, like when we were signed to Jive, I remember, you know, having, we were in a, one of the writing rooms and then there was like, we have a, before we got to know him properly and some other guys in another writing room and we get him talking and like, didn't even know there was black people in, in Wales and all this sort of stuff. And it was like, what? It's like, <laughs> but yeah, but I think, especially like, you know, with the internet and everything now, it doesn't really make much of a difference where you're from these days, as long as the music's good. It's like, look at, look at Magoogoo. Yeah. You know, 
he's a shining example of it doesn't matter where you're from, it's where you're at, sort of thing. You he's know, proper doing his own thing, and he, he's um, he's yeah, man, he's doing well. I'm really happy for to see how like how well he's doing. Class, oh, he's nice. awesome. You know, his music is of such good quality. He is his he is his his own biggest fan. So, but that translates across to everyone else because everyone's you know. It's just like uh, if, if if you, you know, like if you, if you don't like your music, you just sort of like oh it's okay stuff like that. Then people are gonna feel that. But if you're, he's got the confidence of like I don't know Muhammad Ali, <laughs> so it's like <laughs> you know. But the the product is good. The quality of his music is amazing. Yeah, and like my my son's here now, but he's in uh, he's in. There's a, a video coming out where with Afro Cluster. And Magoogoo's in that video, and my son's in that video as well. Sick. Hello. Oh, nice. <laughs> Do you know, I watched, um, I've not, I think I might have seen it a few years ago, but I feel like it's new to me. Is um, Magoogoo and Skunkadelic, the uh, oh, be like, is it where they're both like old, that, like grandpa thing? Oh, yeah, that's cool. class, man. I watched that last night. I was in stitches. Like, yeah, it was so good. That video is awesome. Because I it's didn't so, know Google back then. It was so I good. Their the costume design yeah. and everything, like just the effort gone into the video class. Because yeah. I known Skunkadelic for for years, and like I think his the video came across his timeline. And I didn't really know Magugu then, so I was like, "Who the hell is this guy, man?" <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I didn't even realize he was the old man that, to start with. Like the the makeup was so good, I didn't oh, even realize. Really? Yeah, but um. Yeah, man, his Nobi So tune. I know that's one of his newer ones, but I've rinsed that like fucking on repeat. It's one of those tunes that you don't think it's a banger until. You... Yeah, exactly, exactly. I didn't think it was a banger. I thought it was a. It's good. It was a chill, and then I was like, "Nah, this is a banger!" Like, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. But just yeah. everything. It's like he did. Um, he did a special for me. Um, you know, like sort of like shouting out. You know. DJ Jack yeah. and all that sort of thing, and he wrote, wrote a rap in it, incorporated all it. And he said, "Oh, what do you want me to, want me to, uh, me to do it over?" So I sent him the instrumental that Simon says, and then he sent me. He, so I, he sent me the track back. Simon, so he's doing a special for me over Simon says, and then he sent me the acapella as well, so I can just use it over over any beat. It's like the I did a mix for uh, Radio Wales, and the last track I've got the instrumental of um, Golden by Jurassic Five. And I put the acapella over that. Mm. Uh, mate. So, yeah, he's, he's he's really good. But look, back to the question, yeah, that's it. I mean, as long as the quality of the music is good, it's, it doesn't really make that much of a difference where you're from these days. Yeah. No, it's good. I feel like the internet, I mean, like even with lockdown, isn't it? even now, like we haven't done a gig since... Uh, personally since February the 15th and I'm sure a lot not people have but through lockdown I feel like everyone's had the chance to look at the Welsh scene or look at their own scenes and everyone's had the chance to listen to everyone and yeah. build whatever through the internet and even us doing like we started these these podcast things now in, in lockdown isn't it? so everyone's had a chance to look at everyone's things and kind of calculate what we've already got and pay attention to that and appreciate it and document it which is like a really positive thing i think that's come out of it yeah i think everything's been reset hasn't it really when you think about it everyone's sort of like can every and everyone's in the same boat so it's like there's no more fomo it's like there's no more like oh well yeah. I, i'm not doing this so whatever people are doing this over there because no one's doing yeah. that <laughs> well, yeah, no, just, nothing. <laughs> everything last people mentioned, you know, Magugu and the Honest Poet. I only heard them in lockdown, you know, and they're fucking yeah. amazing. And that's, that's, oh my it. that's it. I think because of lockdown, like you said, everyone is just yeah. sitting out and listening to music, you know. Yeah, like we're, we're maybe too worried about like how do I get big? It's like look around you, like there's so yeah. much good on our doorstep. Oh, we don't have to be so obsessed with what the outer world thinks, you know. Yeah. And it's like, from the start, like going back to my radio show, it's like, from the start of it, I was playing more, I was playing mainly American stuff with the odd UK thing thrown in. To now, I mean, my, a few, not the last show, but 
the show before that, I think I had like almost half of it was Welsh acts. Wow. Yeah. No, I think that's so great. Like even with myself now, obviously I'm well into like the Welsh scene and everything, but even now, just not even out of like choice of, I'm just listening to people a lot more and it's all Welsh, do you know what I mean? Not like I'm specifically trying to listen to people from like, I'm just listening to tunes and it's, it's from Wales, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Without a second thought, so I feel like there's a lot of variety. It's like people like Black Tricks coming back, which is you know, amazing, you know what I mean? And then it's like... like he's yeah. dope, man. Black Tricks is dope. Oh, he's, he always has been. You know what I mean, he's got one of the most recognisable voices in UK hip-hop. He's just, yeah. 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 Well, he's a, na- he's a name we've always known, and I've always known of Black Tricks, Associated Minds and everything. And then he hit us up, like, beginning of lockdown, hit us up started talking said he had an ep and whatever and then it, yeah all popped off and i was just like as soon as i heard it i was just yeah it's just it's something that as you know as vibrant as the scene is at the moment and everything like it's something that's not there yet do you know what i mean nobody's doing yeah. what black tricks is do you know I mean? nobody's doing that are they so it, it was it was refreshing to hear him on some new shit like it's just like this like i'm saying you know black just coming back like, like jamie p's coming back with some new stuff as well and mm-hmm. yeah and then and then there's all the newer artists that are coming out do you know what i mean it's just like amazing if um for our listeners now who are maybe well a, a good portion of our listeners are not going to necessarily be as fucking geeky plugged into welsh rappers us lot if you were just to throw some names off the top of your head for people listening to check out from wales who's a couple names you'd drop Right. Tony. Oh, Tony. Oh, my son's on the phone all day. He's too much after me. <laughs> um, obviously, Black Tricks. Uh, there's a group. Oh, do you know? What? Let me hold on a sec. Let me just. Are they called? Uh, they're called Culture Vultures. Yeah, they're really cool. No, no, you guys. No, no, you guys. But there's a group from North Wales. Like, oh, um, oh, sorry. Is it the OC, oh, OC yeah. guy? Is it, is it? The di- oh, it's Dai, Dai, Flynn. No, oh, I'm, I'm terrible at pronunciations. No, it's still mine. But, oh, what's the name of the track? No. <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. Sorry. <laughs> but it's Dai. <laughs> It's Dai, D A I I F Y N D. He's dope. Can't understand a word he's saying because I can't speak Welsh, but he's really good. Um, D W Smith's EP. Yeah. Amazing. Add there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He's got a track on there which. I can't remember the name of it now, but it, it reminds me of One Mic, One Naz. Yeah. I, him, I messaged him, I said, look, this is your One Mic. It's really... And that is so perfectly, so perfectly made for the whole theme of the EP, like. It's... Yeah, the whole EP is, is so consistent as well. It's just like, it's, it's not like a track, a track, a track, a track. It's just like, he's got the whole thing packaged, lovely. Um, for him, yeah, uh, applied what? science. Oh, yeah, straight up. Like, they, like Alchemy has got to be one of my favorite producers. Yeah, yeah man. Um, he's not, dope. He's, he's just, just remixed Welsh, them. Yeah, not just Welsh producer. I'm on about, like, producer, full stop. Yeah, he, he's, he, he literally, you know when, I'm sure you get it, right, with uh, sent someone a beat or whatever, and they were like, yeah, I'll get it back to you. It never happens. Or they sent the verse six months later i sent alchemy a tune to remix for me and he sent it back like an hour later <laughs> and breathes beats like an hour later he sent back the remix and it was fucking crazy and i was just like yeah, bro you see, he's, he's got to be one of my top like he's definitely in my top 10 of producers yeah and i i know him and then people say oh it's only because you know him i'm like no look listen to his music. no no he's fire like that, that's, he, he said ages ago, he's like, oh, I really want to do a soul EP. I mean, he's done it and it's amazing. Yeah, with Carrie. It's yeah. yeah, so Carrie's, um, 
one of our, well, yeah, one of, um, well, Hagee specifically is him, uh, her and Hagee were a boyfriend and girlfriend in their younger days. So, uh, yeah, yeah, she's she's really good. It's good to hear her on some proper good beats and uh, well produced. Like it's really good. Yeah, hey, that's a, that's a nod to the internet there because Alchemy was just like, I want to make a so album. I need singers, and I just yeah. tagged them in. And then like next thing I knew, they were like, it was like getting released. I was like, what? Oh, did you make some music? Yeah. I was like, oh, what? You got a project? I was like, oh, that's fucking amazing. Uh, he, he booked it, us early on, like in some weird forest fucking. She booked us in like a forest party, just weird shit. And we didn't know we met him there, but Hagee stopped our set by rolling a spliff on the Mac. And then we met Hagee a year later or something. And then after knowing him another year, we suddenly remembered, fuck, you're the guy who fucked up our set on the fucking Mac, rolling a biff. <laughs> but yeah, it was that girl that booked us now she made a project of alchemy. So yeah. But yeah, it's like like his group applied science, like amazing. Um, I've done cuts on um, Dick Dastley's new project. Yeah, Bean, is it? How he is on Facebook, that's his project. He's <laughs> 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 awesome. But, he actually commented um, saying in response to uh, the Facebook hater, he said. Uh, Jaff is on my new project doing cuts and he's the most musical thing on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as soon as um as soon as any anybody's a as soon as anyone's a dick on Facebook, you can count on Dean to be there in five seconds to shut them the fuck down. He searches for any any he's like sort of hovering across the He's just hovering and he's just waiting for someone to like 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 come. Like... <laughs> awesome. But, um, um, well, I want to touch on is a uh, oh, sorry if you'll keep going on that. Yeah, yeah, carry on, man. Uh, Tistion, the Tist Tistion, is that how I say it? Yeah. I'd like to touch on that because I remember I, I think we talked about it with Mr. Formula and it came up a lot in the thread about Welsh hip hop history. And then Mr. Formula basically said they were the godfathers of um of Welsh language yeah, hip hop or Welsh language rap and they were the first to do it and you were their DJ. So yeah. can you tell us any yeah. anything about that time and well, how that was, all formed? It was I can't even remember what year it was, but it was around about it was late nineties, something like that. And they were recording um an album in a studio down I think it was just off Albany Road and through a friend of a friend's they, they said they wanted the, the DJ to do some cuts and got in contact with me. So I went down, did some cuts for them. And the next thing I know, I get a phone call. Oh, is there any chance you could DJ for us at some gigs and stuff like that? So um, I was like, yeah, no problem. And then ended up being their DJ for a few years. Just basically most of their gigs seemed to be mid to north wales like i don't speak a word of welsh i'm with languages and stuff like that so literally i i i to this day i don't know what they were rapping about so um i know a lot of it was like political and i know like like um i've been they'd explained some of the stuff to me and all that but i was like yeah okay it's cool um, you just wrap your 16 i'll Scratch for eight, you have number 60 hours, scratch for eight, whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it was this weird time. And it's like, I remember we did like the ice and stuff like that, but it was surrounded by people who spoke Welsh. So I was literally doing the job of the DJ who speaks with his hands because yeah. I couldn't speak Welsh. So, so yeah, it's. Uh, Can we chocolate bar? Yeah, of course you can have chocolate. Um, but yeah, uh, like there's a video that Sophie Sophie Barrows put in the group um, of a track for by Tistion called Original Scamster. And it was on E Dot, which is like a Welsh uh, Welsh language music program. And like this, 
there's um like sophie's on it who used to go in the name little miss uh she had a record label called round the records in cardiff that uh, sorry just want to jump on that actually i found that and it's had like 100 views on youtube and that beat is absolutely ridiculous and her flow is sick it had like the it's had like a hundred views on YouTube or something silly like that. Like the rounded thing with Little Miss that you did. I, I what's it called? I I, I posted it in the event page. Block off the roots, is it? Yeah, something like that. The one I the one I produced for. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. The yeah. beat is sick and like the flow is sick. And I was like, what? How is this only had like a hundred views, man? This is madness. Like, what's going on? Anyway, I posted it in the yeah. event page, guys. So like, have a listen to that. It. Was, that was in like two thousand, something like that. I did that. Um, that was when she had an EP out, but, um, she was doing stuff with, that's how I first met her was through when she was doing stuff with Tistion because they, they knew her from wherever. And then she, every now and again, I uh, don't do that to the door. Every now and again, she'd, um, Hi. she'd guest on one of their tracks. And then, cause I hooked up with them, I met, met Sophie. Um, but that original Scampters tune that had, um, Sparky on there, who was one of the underdogs. Uh, he had Nathan on there as well, who was one of the underdogs and the urban poets. Um, two of the guys from Shawnee's, basically. Uh, and then Little Miss, and we're, we're all on there, like a posse cut on this Welsh TV program. <laughs> but yeah, it's a pretty cool track. But um, I'm like losing thread now. <laughs> yeah, Tistion. Yeah, um, and I was with Tistion around, I was DJing for Tistion like around about the same time I was DJing for Manchild as well. So it was like, it was weird. It was like a toss up between gigs and stuff sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes Manchild would win because we were doing festivals. So I was like, nah, I'm doing a festival, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But at that, there was that time that uh, Mr. Formula was saying about when they went to um, uh, the London. The London, the in London. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I watched that video the other day, and I remember you saying um, you were yeah, doing something else. Yeah, I was for the men, the Tistian men, and I think that was because I was doing a gig with Manchild. That was really interesting. It's another one again, <clears throat> like you say. Um, Hello. Like, I, I use a lot of Welsh words in it, and, Hello. Uh, you know, but I'm not a fluent Hello. Welsh speaker, so I, I watched that whole that whole BBC documentary bit about Wild Ship Hop and like it annoyed me that I couldn't really understand it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It, it, seemed, it seemed like such an interesting thing at the time. Yeah, it's, it's, so I mean, it's like, I, I couldn't understand what the hell they were saying. <laughs> yeah, so one of, um, one of our friends, like Alan, do you know Chef? Was it Chef? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chef Kwan? Yeah. Yeah, so Aled, who's like, he used to be the manager in The Parrot, good friend of ours, now does uh, Beast PR and a lot of music stuff, but that was one of his very good friends was Chef, and he's always told yeah. me about him. Um, like Chef, what he it wasn't, wasn't until I'd watched that video. I... Yeah, he wasn't in Tistion when I was, when I first started, and then he came back, but apparently he was in Tistion when it first, first started, before I was with him, and then he sort yeah. of went off and then came back again. So I've done like... Yeah. Did, quite a few gigs with Cher. Nice dude, man. Got a big up Andrew Jones, yeah, man. who's been um, following on uh, our conversation and posting up some links on the page. Like he's, um, he, he, he mentioned Dair uh, Huil Doif, and he said Doif meaning wise, and he's posted their Twitter. And he's also posted up a tisti on uh, with translation called Hen Gel with Plidine hey. Noev. So like big up Andrew Jones for following oh. along and posting some links up there. Like. All right, big up Andrew. Wicked, but yeah, so I, I went down a. That's when I, I started that YouTube channel. Um, that I posted in the group. I started that the other day because I went down like a rabbit hole of yeah. I saw the group and I was like, Oh, I remember all the old stuff. So I went down this YouTube rabbit hole, yeah, like searching for Tistion, searching for groups I was in and stuff like that, yeah. So, yeah, it was, no, it was mad. I, I, someone posted the other day, I don't know if it was, um. If it was Rolo or Disprol or someone, but like their CD archive or whatever, and it was just mad. Like, oh, was no, like... that, was, that was Captain, and he had like a CD. Oh, that was Captain, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It's basically Captain Barrett. He had from um, Higher Learning. Yeah, it was crazy. Literally, I went through the list, and I was like, I've not heard like ninety percent of this stuff. Like, 
It's crazy. Yeah, there was like Christian stuff in there. There was Urban Poet stuff, and there was what was the other group? Yeah, loads of stuff. Even like Squid oh, Ninja stuff, and oh, like it just stuff. so it was like three groups. I I was in. <laughs> yeah, the CD. Yeah. Gosh, but, um, no, I'd love to hear some of that stuff. Even um, even Gus. Do you know Eck and Ramble? Who is it? Sorry. So, Eck and Ramble. Eck and Ramble. Uh, Gus. Augustus John, he's, he lives in Brecon now. He's from Car- Ekin Ramble and Archive Mind. He's, he makes oh, beats oh, in it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I do. Sorry, yes. I Ekin Ramble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he oh, sent oh, me yeah. the other day. Uh, H- HSG? Yeah, yeah. The, um, With, that, like Stagger and that lot? Stagger, like Meta Beats. Uh, um, all of yeah, the, all the squids, uh, everything. Oh, he sent me this whole album that's like yeah, I've got yeah the, all the Barry Boys, Heckler, White Label, somewhere. Squids, uh, Casto, Joe yeah. Dirt, people on top of that, people who weren't in the Squids, just this whole album, and it's not even labelled. Like no, all the songs are just the song names, and I'm literally listening to them like. Oh, they, that's Joe Dirt. I mean, all the Squids that, and that they they they're like, it's like it's like Barry was uh was the Staten Island of South Wales, you know, Cardiff area almost because it's like there's it it definitely something in the water because everyone that's come out of there has been amazing. Like you got Scammer, you got yeah. Joe Blow, you got Raul Duke, you got like Joe De, like Kesto, all of those boys. <laughs> you know what I mean, it, it, they're all dope. And yeah, yeah. watching side of things as well. It's like you got Heckler as well. Like Heckler's um, like awesome. I love Heckler. Yeah, man. Heckler's un- underlooked, I think. He doesn't uh, put himself out there as much. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't try to put himself out there, but I feel like maybe not in the in the past, but he's still doing it now. And I think he, he for now he's underlooked because he's fucking he's up there and he. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like the Wu Tang of like the Cardiff area because it's like they they sort of out there a bit in Barry, but. Yeah. You wipe the floor with anyone, mate. Honestly, they're amazing. Yeah. That's a good comparison. I think you can you can hear the Wu Tang influence as well, in it as well. Yeah, and then you look at like like Raul as well, like Raul Duke. Where yeah. he's gone, he's gone from being an MC, dope as hell MC, to being a dope producer, and now he's doing like I saw a post and he who was it? It was like tragedy. Gaddafi had messaged him to do an album cover. All right. That's awesome. I remember yeah. bumping into him like pre-COVID um, in HMV. I said to him, there, I said, oh, what are you doing? You were uh, looking for albums you've done. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's just done everyone, hasn't he, man? He's, yeah, he's, it's, that's quality. That's dope to see. Yeah. Larry Train Station is the background to a Ghostface record. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's yeah. so good. So, um, Harry, I'm not sure what you're saying, but should we maybe start wrapping up with yeah, some... Yeah, man. So we've we've been talking for like over two hours, like, and it feels like we've only touched like that much about what what we wanted to. Yeah, there's there's a bit more. There's like I, like as we're on this sort of local stuff, like the urban poets thing, like that came about through me knowing Nathan, who um, underdogs. Um, we started making tracks together met up with a singer called Carrie at a Cool Hurt gig of all places. Um, and then we just formed Urban Poets, which was like very, like Nathan was a Rasta. So it was very sort of set in the Rastafarian ideologies. Um, <laughs> Carrie was like a jazz singer. So we had that side of it. Um, and she was very on, on the ball and she sent our CD off to uh, this competition, we didn't know anything about it. I was like, yeah, just go ahead. And next thing we know, we Ooh, excited. Uh, next thing we, know, we, we won the competition, which was the Diesel U Music Awards. Um, it was the first ever one. And uh, <laughs> and we won the uh, best hip hop group at the Diesel U Music Awards. Um, it was the first one. It was the same year that um, DJ Yoda won best scraps DJ. Um, and then from there, we got sponsored by Diesel. We did like a uh, couple of festivals off the back of it and stuff. And then we started doing a few more demos, which I'll probably post up on YouTube actually. Um, 
and then Carrie went to Australia, I was on holiday, Nathan went off and got married and that was the end of Urban Poets, basically. But, um, <laughs> so two things have happened through this conversation, like literally in the last like five minutes, because we mentioned two people. So big up Joe Blow, he's just come yeah. on and he said, HSG hurts so good. That was what we went by before Squid Ninjas. Um, yeah, man, HSG, I'm big up Joe Blow, man. HSG, there's big a poster up. somewhere in the group. Of, um, I think it was Elliot posted it. And it's a, a, um, a gig called Battle Cry. And HSG was the, the headline act. Mad. So, yeah. And, and, oh, coming in and mob, mob heavy. <laughs> and mob heavy, just like, yeah. It's sick, man. There's a certain, there's a certain fucking track. I can't... Ah, uh, it's called... It's, uh... So I try and find it now. And the other thing, then, because we also were mentioning Heckler, yeah, and that you know this whole ba- there's something in the water in Barry. There definitely is. I don't, like that's one of our quick fire questions, but it's um, Heckler. Eakin Ramble said that Heckler's going to drop a project on Diff Press real soon, and Woo! I don't know if that's news um, for anyone, but that's I've news got, for me. Like, I've got um, right. speaking of Heckler, I've got a mix coming out on um, the. Uh, what's it called? Oh, my mind's gone blank. It's been a long conversation. Yeah, uh, shout out to Ramble. Coming out on Friday. Space. Ah, mm. uh, what's it called? Sorry, lost. But anyway, the second track in is a heckler track. So there. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll post it on Facebook. Like you'll that. see it. Just, yeah, just no. a reminder that DJ Jaffa is now currently live on this, that, and the third. His is it <laughs> <Yeah>. weekly? <laughs> Don't listen to me talking. Don't listen to yeah. me playing. <laughs> <laughs> is it a weekly thing or is it like it's um, fortnightly? Fortnightly. It's a radio show. It's live at the moment. So yeah, check it out if you want to listen to some beats instead of uh, our conversations. Just to bring back on that, uh, big up the Paul. HST. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the album now, and I've gone through it. It's all sick, but um, we got it as a. If you're listening, Joe Blow, we got it. That is a tune and a half. Uh, Dragon Folk is another one. That's banging. Uh, yeah, Apocalyptic Friday Blows, Jigsaw Blues, Rise Above You, Styles Hardcore, Terror Slang, Full Fire. I have to dig yeah, it up. I've, I've got a white label for that. So, uh, oh, it's fire, man. I never heard it. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I can ramble, sent it to me the other day and I just blasted it all out. And I was like, I had to, I was proper listening to try and figure out who was spitting at the specific times. Right? But, fire. but yeah, it's the, you know, there's the, all the squid ninjas, man. Yeah. Amazing. It seems like they've, they heard you, they heard you calling and like, they're all yeah. jumping. Like, <laughs> yeah. went up. <laughs> so shall we do some quick fire to finish this off yeah yeah man alright shall we go around yeah yeah just uh, what was your What? Uh, I don't know what's going on with the internet so what was your first set of record uh, the turntables what was your first set of turntables my first set of turntables were the, <laughs> I don't even know the number but all I remember is they were JVC Direct drive, and I only got them direct drive by chance because I didn't know what direct drive and belt drive was. I just know I wanted turntables. But the direct drive was there was no like dial like on 1200s. It was like a little tiny dial. You had to turn it around. You had to guess when it was locked. It was because there was no lock on it. Um, and I had my mother bought me one, and my girlfriend at the time bought me one. Sick. So, yeah, and I bought the mixer. Um, Obviously, you've played in a lot of countries around the world. I said, just saying, who's my, who's my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriend at the time when I was, like, younger. You've got to Don't explain worry. time travel to your son, though. Don't tell your mum. <laughs> um, so you've played in a lot of countries around the world, obviously. Yeah. I was just wondering, what, what country did you play in where it was the most bizarre, like, the most different? Yeah, my son just answered that, China. Yeah. Was, yeah, it was the most bizarre and it was the most awesome gigs I've ever done. Um, I went over there with Slamo, um, who's, he's a B-boy. Um, he runs, like, you know, he was one of the people who used to run Break and Break. Um, so, I, and he MCs as well. So I took him over as my MC, my hype man. Um, 
It's my man DSK hooked it up. He's like from, I think he's like Southampton, maybe somewhere like that. I can't remember where he's from, but he lives in China now and he was a promoter and stuff. So he got me over there and I played in like Qingdao Flip for the first gig. No one spoke English. So we were communicating through like Google Translate. Um, and then we went to the club and there was like a 50 foot wall, like video wall, all with mine and Slamo's faces on it. <laughs> um, and then the second gig was in Beijing. There's a club called Club Mix. And it owns, same time. It, in, it's a uh, Club Mix and it holds like a couple of thousand people. And it's all like kids of like triads and stuff to go there. So the car park is all full of like all these high end cars and stuff. Um, but that was like the almost one of the best gigs and one of the worst gigs ever because my I had I was working using Serato and my computer crashed halfway from my set. So it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh no. <laughs> Luckily there was another DJ then he just jumped on it. They had two sets of decks. He jumped on the other set of decks until my computer booted back up and I did, uh, did the rest of the gig. But then the best, I was probably one of the best clubs I ever played in my life was the third, third club. And that was um, Club Mingus. And it was started at six in the evening, finished at six in the morning. It was um, an open air rooftop nightclub in the middle of Beijing. Wow. And there's a there's a party that goes on in LA called the Do Over, and I I'm I as soon as I found out about this place I was obsessed by it I was like YouTube videos everything, um and it's like everyone's played there like Eight Track Jen Jeff J Rock you name them they've played there it's, it's amazing, and doing that club Mingus is the nearest I've got to playing the, the Do Over. It was like there was people from China there there was Americans there there was UK people there, it was. Just, Awesome. It was so good. Um, and I got so drunk. Yeah. Between, there was only three of us playing. There was me, there was uh, yeah, the SK, and then there was the promoter. And we played everything from like 90s house to old school hip hop to reggae to boogie, funk, soul, everything just across the boards. And everyone was just loving it. And then I just can't remember getting back to the hotel or anything. It was just, but yeah, that's got to be one of the important Turn it. Let's turn the TV on. Turn it. All the way, all the way, down, down, down. We're going to get silence for copyright. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Turn it down now because they're going to get silence for copyright. Young Jaffa in the building. That's fine. Um, yeah, so that was like, that's got to be like the best night. Yeah. Done. Actually, I'm going to go into the other room because he's wanted to watch YouTube. But, uh, <laughs> right. See, I have no control over anything in this house. I'm, but anyway, um, yeah. Right. So, yeah, that was Beijing was like, yeah, amazing. That, that club was brilliant. So, okay. Jam, you got one. Oh, everyone's frozen now. As it glitched out. Just, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you glitched right, right. yeah, that's why I thought. I thought everyone had frozen. <laughs> have you got a quick five question? I have a quick five question. All right, uh, it's got a fuck music. What's your favourite? Uh, what's your favourite film of all time? My favourite film of all time. Oh, Blade Runner. Sick. Blade Runner. <laughs> Yeah. The original? The original. I'm guessing. Yeah. Fair enough. I actually sampled um, a track off Blade Runner for a Kids With Toys track. That one I was on about chocolate. There's a piano on it and I just cut the hell into it and swapped it all around. And yeah. Top three, what's your second and third? Oh, That's harsh. That's oh, not a quick fire question. <laughs> That's a triple quick fire. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm jaffing up the quick fire ending. Uh, second and third, I can't even think. Well, yeah, nah, you don't have to. You don't have to do it at this point. Um, I wasn't really lost there. Cause, yeah, I'm nostalgic. <laughs> why? Why are you called DJ Jaffa? Because my name's Jason Andrew Farrell, so it's J A F, Jaff. 
That is a good fucking answer. Ekin Rambles asked a quick fire question. He's asking, who would you recommend for physical distribution? Physical distribution? Oh, I don't know. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not the best person to ask about that. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd ask some like physical distribution who would they ask because anyone who's put vinyl out lately like like I mean Joe Blows but oh Stagger's a good one he's put vinyl out yeah I'm just literally it's like I haven't like I start I was producing for a while obviously with the um with the kids and all that but that was literally just producing tracks i haven't really put anything out of my own like physical like that so when i've had to go and get my hands dirty de dealing with just yeah, yeah. or anything like that so i'm the wrong person to ask to be honest yeah, it's fair enough. i mean i we've done our digital digital distribution through ek and ramble so i mean if he's asking you the questions i have not got an answer for it <laughs> yeah, I'm not. That's one thing I'm not good on, to be honest. Yeah. It's like I like with the production and anything. It's like I even st I've stopped producing in 2000, 2017, I think. Was, no, it was earlier than that. 2007, probably. Because I did a track for, there was a rapper called um, L Train from Buffalo, New York. And I did a track for his album. That was the last one I did. So, but yeah, and it was all, it was all a thing of like, problems with management and my house got burgled as well and I lost a laptop with a load of beats and programs yeah. and stuff. And it was just like yeah I'm just, I, I, I was getting burned out by it so it was like we were, we were getting asked by our management because they didn't know what to do with us so we were getting asked to do tracks for like Ashley Teasdale and stuff like that was like high school musical and we're like what <laughs> it's like no nah, no it's like we could have done it and the money would have been good, but it's not what we wanted to do. So, but then I went back to DJing and my first love. So, and I've been doing that ever since. And I, I think I've traveled more than doing the DJing than I ever did with the beats. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've done a like a, a, a wedding in a castle in Tuscany. Or because <laughs> hear me do, the, the guy whose wedding it was, he heard me doing a, um, an 80s boogie set. I love the music. So he, he was like an ex footballer and flew me over to Tuscany, Tuscany to DJ at his wedding in a castle. <laughs> it's like random shit like that happened. Yeah. yeah. So have we got any more questions in the in the chat? No, that's it. We're we're wrapping up now. Um, Amazing. I, I wanted to because I know we've been speaking for two more than two hours, and I wanted to say thank you massively for your time because that's a long, long, long interview. It's it's, oh, it's tiring on the brain, you know. So. It's a big oh, especially my old brain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeless with dates. I'm hopeless with names. So what you've got out of me. <laughs> well, like I said, we've literally touched on that much and um, there's so much more. Um, Gem, do you have anything else? No, I'm pretty dry, I think. Yeah, on, um, so, on my brain capacity. Yeah. Um, there's two things that I want to end on because I think they're really important in this current time. And I know that you've been a voice as well and what what it is is firstly uh the hip-hop documentary talk that's going on who would who would you say like would be the presenter on that like is there one person that you think should be like you know tying it all together is there one person that you can think of in your time like what, to, present, to present it and yeah, sort of yeah like, yeah to be uh, the like the one who's walking around like and like the or Kuiper or magugu big up and then the second one is the Black Lives Matter movement is more current than ever. Like with what's going on in the news, it's, it's mind blown what's going on in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what responsibilities do we have? And I'm asking you genuinely, like, what, what can we do to support people who are feeling at the moment like the pressure? Like what, what can we do to support and what can hip hop, the community of hip hop do to support as well at the moment at this current time? Well, first of all, just listen to people. It's it's been a long time where people have been going through these things and sort of having these experiences, like me, you know, from school and stuff. 
that can go outside that scooter. Um, you know, me in school and stuff, I, I went to a predominantly white school and the amount of like racial abuse I had was ridiculous. Um, I went to school when Roots was on TV. So the day after it was first on TV, my name changed to Toby or Kunda Kinte, you know. But then I, I sort of withdrew a lot. I didn't really have a voice back then because I didn't think anyone would listen to me. But now people have voices and they need, they're speaking up and now people need to listen instead of, well, actually, mm -hmm. well, actually, can you know, that can be done with. Forget that. You know, you need to listen to people, listen to people's experiences and realize it is all real. It all does happen. Um, and just be there for people. Do you know what I mean? Just like support as much as you can, but listen, don't like, like with women, don't, like men, they say men mansplain about stuff and all that. Well, don't blacksplain. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's same strange. sort of thing. So, it's no, it's just some... we're listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you froze. But, do you know what I mean? It's that. It's like listening to people, support, just, and just black people can't change things on their own because. Black people are of a very small, not just black people, just people of color, minorities, we're with a small percentage in this country, we're a small percentage in America. We need, basically, we need white people to speak for us as well. And like call people out and say, look, this is not okay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that's, that's basically it. It's like, yeah. It seems like people have found a voice now, and but but then, especially like online and stuff. I've just I've I've given up trying to debate with people because I just block, rinse, repeat. That's it. Uh, there's no point. If people, there's if people have made up their minds enough to to fight you on something, then they need to find it out. And they need to find out why they're wrong themselves big up yeah you know what i mean so and it's like it's across all it's across all things it's why it's not i'm not just saying like bigotry as a whole homophobia sexism you know misogyny ableism any transphobia all of it, it all flows from the same stream it's all it's all branches of the same tree yeah and the, the ignorance it's been so, a, it's a long battle isn't it it's not like it's just it's not you know what, um and there's things that are happening now that used to happen when I was 11. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, No Justice, No Peace by uh, Sizzaway. Mate, that's a, tune, a, a car tune. Yeah, he he literally he hit, hit me up yesterday asking uh, to get on a tune with us, isn't it? So I was gonna, I'm going to send him some beats and stuff. But um, yeah, yeah, but I think I heard it first. I think you played it. I think I listened to him actually because he's another one. And that, he's that from, is like he's in Aberystwyth, isn't he? But he's from Zimbabwe. He yeah, moved to Cumbran, and now he lives in Aberystwyth. Um, but when we yeah. go, well, when we get in the car, like my son, oh, put a no justice, no peace tune on. That's his favorite. It's on his playlist on Spotify. He loves it. You know, I get, as I as I love it. It is absolute bang. I put it on my mix for Radio Wales. I played it on my on my radio show. Dope tune, and very. Well put together. What's your favourite tune, Ad? At the moment, what do we sing in the car? Sing no no. I know you know, but what what do we, what's what, what's it go like? No. No justice, no peace, no police. There we go. Yeah. Boy, that is an advert for Sizzwaves. Right, this clip already is an advert for Sizzway. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's been an absolute nope. pleasure to have you on. We're really yeah. grateful yeah, for your time. Yeah. Like. Like, Reaper, bye. Bye. Big up, young Jaffa in the building. Dad, <laughs> like this. Hold on a sec. I'm almost finished, and then we'll start Literally, then, yeah. just just wrapping up now. So, like the next one we've got, actually, I'm pasting in um to the thing. It's uh with Amy Sinclair. It's this weekend. She's actually um a really interesting lady that uh a friend of mine met in London. Um. And she's a singer. Um, she f has been on ITV recently talking about uh, mental health, 
during the lockdown and because of BLM and everything. And she's going to be there talking about her career in music on the weekend on Saturday. Um, she actually uh, is the mother in a, f a video. Um, oh God. And she, she told me what it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I'm going to, uh, we're going to be talking about it this weekend. It's going to be at two o'clock to four o'clock on EMW TV. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, big up Harry. Thanks for having us. Harry is the mastermind behind all of this. So no, big up Harry. You guys are pushing man, forward. You know. I wouldn't. Be... <laughs> Harry's a man on the boards. Like, <laughs> yeah, just trying to. Well, yeah, that's it, isn't it? When the venues are closed, we need to do something else, right? So this is what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I freaked out when it was like, oh, I can't teach you anymore. I got a live stream, live stream, and then I'm getting blocked everywhere, and it's like, uh... but yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's that copyright thing, isn't it? So yeah, big up. Um, I'm gonna put that on the screen now, the the hold for the next one, so we can all see that. There we go, that's live. Uh, any final words before we wrap up, guys? Um, I don't know. If you want to hear anything else by me, go to my mixed cloud. Um, just type in DJ Jaffa and mixed clouds will come up. Um, Instagram DJ Jaffa, Twitter DJ Jaffa. Facebook DJ Jaffa, everything DJ Jaffa. I'm very Googleable, as they say. You are Googleable. <laughs> Google <laughs> um, but yeah, nice one, guys. It's been a Good pleasure. Respect. Good to see you, man. Nice one. Wicked. Nice one.